The Zeitgeist Movement Defined Realizing a New Train of Thought Part 2 Social Pathology Defining Public Health We are all responsible for all. Dostoevsky Overview What is the true measure of success for a society? What is it that makes us happy, healthy, stable and in balance with the world around us? Is not our success really our ability to understand and adapt to the realities of our world for the best outcome possible for any given circumstance? What if we were to find that the very nature of our social system was actually reducing our quality of life in the long term? As will be argued in this essay, modern social structures, values and practices have deviated away from, or are largely ignorant of, what true societal health means. What our social institutions today give priority to or discount by design, coupled with the goals and motivations associated with personal success, which are all too often clearly decoupled from what true life support and advancement means, is a subject given little thoughtful consideration in the world today. In fact, most prosperity and integrity measures for the human condition are now haphazardly equated to mere economic baselines such as GDP, PPI or employment figures. Sadly, these measures tell us virtually nothing about true human well-being and prosperity. The term public health is a medical classification, essentially defined as, the approach to medicine that is concerned with the health of the community as a whole. While often narrowly used in relationship to transmittable disease and broad social conditions, the context here will extend into all aspects of our lives, including not only physiological health but mental health as well. If the value of a social system is measured by the health of its citizenry over time, assessing and comparing conditions and consequences through simple trend analysis and factor accounting should give insight into what can be changed or improved on the social level. The central context here is how the social condition itself, the socioeconomic system, is affecting human health on the whole. In the words of physician Rudolf Virchow, medicine is a social science and politics nothing but medicine on a large scale. Virko recognized that any public health issue is invariably related to society as a whole. Its structure, characteristics and value reinforcements have a profound influence on the health and behavior of a society and arguments regarding the merit of new social ideas inevitably come down to a rational assessment of quality through comparison. Since each respective component of public health has its own characteristics and causality, we can also work to consider alternative approaches to a given problem resolution or improvement that might not be currently in practice, but clearly should be. An analysis of current public health components to understand what is happening over time and in different circumstances, coupled with a per case evaluation of each issue with an inferential consideration of what could fix or improve these results on the largest possible scale, is the basis of the train of thought expressed here. It is the conviction of TZM that the existing social model is a cause of social pathology, with a perpetuation of imbalance that is unnecessarily generating both physiological and psychological disorders across the population, not to mention systemically limiting human potential and problem resolution in many ways. Of course, this context also naturally extends into environmental health, meaning the state of the planet, as such ecological problems slash pressures slash alleviations always have an effect on our public health in the long term. However, that will not be a focus in this essay. This analysis will separate the subject of public health into two general categories, physiological and psychological, with each category broken into categorizes that represent dominant problems seen in a relevant percentage of the overall population. However, let it be well understood that physiological and psychological outcomes rarely, if ever, have singular causes. There is a biopsychosocial relationship to virtually all human phenomena, illuminating, once again, the multi-level symbiosis characteristic of the human being. In other words, while the problem being focused on might be considered physiological on the surface, the underlying cause of that outcome might very well be psychological or sociological, for example. The Economic Factor as noted, the main thesis of this essay is to show the deep effect our global socioeconomic system has on public health, with a specific focus on the power of poverty, stress and inequality. 
If one was to take a quick glance at the major causes of death globally, as put forward by the World Health Organization, clear differences based on the economic state of a region, such as the fact that cancers are more common in high-income societies while diarrheal diseases are more common in low-income societies, gives insight as to how the broad context of socioeconomic position can affect public health. Mahatma Gandhi once said poverty is the worst form of violence. His context relates to the unnecessary deaths caused by poverty in the sense of the broad limitations such severe financial restrictions have on health. This idea was later encompassed in the term structural violence, defined by Dr. James Gilligan as the increased rates of death and disability suffered by those who occupy the bottom rungs of society. He differentiates structural violence from behavioral violence, where the former operates continuously rather than sporadically. Please note that the term violence in this context is not limited to the usual classification of physical harm, such as person-to-person -person combat or abuse. The context extends to include the often unseen social oppression that, through the chain of causality characteristics inherent to our social system, leads to the unnecessary harm of people, both physical, psychological, or both. Examples of this can range from obvious to complex in the chain of cause and effect. A simple macro example would be the prevalence of diarrheal diseases in poverty-stricken societies. These diseases kill about 1.5 million children each year. It is completely preventable and treatable and while the infection itself is spread through contaminated food and drinking water, or from person to person as a result of poor hygiene, its very preventability and rarity in first world nations by comparison shows that the real cause is now not the disease itself, but the poverty condition that enables it to flourish. However, the causality doesn't stop there. We then need to ask the question, what is causing the poverty? A more abstract micro example would be human development problems when adverse pressures in family or community structures occur. Imagine a single mother who, due to the financial need to raise her child, must work for income a great deal in order to make ends meet, limiting her availability for the child personally. The pressures not only reduce needed support and guidance for the child's development, she also develops tendencies for depression and anxiety due to the ongoing stress of debt, bills and the like, and frustration-driven abuse begins to materialize in the family. This then causes severe emotional loss in the child and the development of neurotic and unhealthy mental states emerge, such as a propensity for drug addiction. Years later, still suffering from the pain felt in those early periods, the now adult child dies in a heroin overdose. Question, what caused the overdose? The heroin? The mother's influence? Or the economic circumstance the mother found herself which disallowed balance and thoughtful care of her child? Clearly, there is no utopia for the human condition and to think we can adjust the socioeconomic system to thwart all such structurally related issues, macro and micro, 100% of the time, is absurd. However, what is possible is a dramatic improvement of such public health problems by shifting the nature of the socioeconomic condition in the most strategic manner we can. As we proceed with the per-case analysis of major mental and physical disorders in the world, it will be found that the true imperative for public health improvement rests almost entirely on this socioeconomic premise of causality. According to Jernot Kohler and Norman Alcock in their 1976 work An Empirical Table of Structural Violence, a dramatic 18 million deaths were found to occur each year due to structural violence and that study was over 30 years ago. Since that time, the global gap between rich and poor has more than doubled, suggesting now that the death toll is even much higher today. In effect, structural violence is the most deadly killer on the planet. The following chart shows rates of death of a specific demographic, revealing the more broad correlation of low income and increased mortality. Above, G. D. Smith, J. D. Neaton, D. Wentworth, R. Stamler and J. Stamler, Socioeconomic Differentials in Mortality Risk Among Men Screened for the Multiple Risk Factor Intervention Trial, I. White Men, American Journal of Public Health, 1996, 86, 486-96. Physiological health. The core physiological problems of the human population today include major mortality producing epidemics such as cancer, heart disease, stroke, etc. Relatively minor problems that not only reduce quality of life, 
but also often precede those major illnesses include high blood pressure, obesity and other issues that, while less critical by comparison, are still usually a part of the process that can lead to major illnesses and death over time. Again, it is important to remember that the causality of these physical diseases is not strictly physical in the narrow sense of the word as modern study has found deep psychosocial stress relationships to seemingly detached physiological issues. According to the World Health Organization, the most common shared major causes of death in low, middle and high-income countries are heart disease, lower respiratory infections, stroke and cancer. While each of these illnesses, and many more, can be found related to the causal points that follow, for simplicity's sake heart disease will be a focus here. Case Study, Heart Disease While the treatment of heart disease has led to a recent mild global decline in heart attacks and deaths overall, the diagnosis of heart disease has not subsided and by some regional studies is on the rise, or on pace to increasing substantially. Coronary heart disease is still considered by the WHO as the leading cause of death globally, and it has been found that while there are genetic factors in play, 90% of those dying have risk factors influenced by lifestyle and overall, the disease is widely considered preventable if lifestyle adjustments are made. In short, well-established relationships to high-fat diets, smoking, alcohol, obesity, high cholesterol, diabetes and other risk factors allow us to extend the causality of heart disease and when we follow the influences, the most profound broad influence found has to do not only with absolute income, but relative socioeconomic status. The WHO makes it generally clear that on the global scale, lower socioeconomic status breeds more heart disease and naturally more of the risk factors that lead to it. This, on one side, depicts a direct economic relationship to the occurrence of disease. There is no evidence to show that genetic differences between regional groups could be responsible for these variations, and it is obvious to see how a lack of purchasing power leads people into lifestyles that include many such risk factors. A 2009 study in the American Journal of Epidemiology called Life Course Socioeconomic Position and Incidence of Coronary Heart Disease found that the longer a person remains in poverty, the more likely he or she is to develop heart disease. People who were economically disadvantaged throughout life were more likely to smoke, be obese, and have poor diets and the like. In an earlier study by epidemiologist Dr. Ralph R. Frerichs, focusing specifically on the socioeconomic divide in the city of Los Angeles, California, found that the death rate from heart disease was 40% higher for poor men overall than for wealthier ones. Given our original thesis to consider a link from the social system itself to the prevalence of disease and their associated risk factors, we need to consider the direct relationship of stress and purchasing power. Beginning with the latter, which is more simple, clearly poor health habits occur in lower-income environments due to the lack of funds for better nutrition, medical attention and education. For example, many of the high-fat, high-sodium risk factor foods leading to heart disease tend to be the most inexpensive food found in stores. It is worth noting that our socioeconomic model produces goods based upon the purchasing power of targeted demographics. The decision to produce poor quality food goods is made for the interest of profit and since the vast majority of the planet is relatively poor, it is no surprise that in order to meet that market, quality must be reduced to allow for competitive buying. In other words, there is a market for each social class and naturally the lower the class, the lower the quality. This reality is an example of a direct social system link to causality for heart disease. While education about the difference between quality food products could help the decision process of a poor person to eat better, the financial restrictions inherent to their condition could easily make that decision difficult if not impossible as, again, such goods are more expensive on average. In an age where food production and human nutrition is a well-understood scientific phenomenon as far as what works and what doesn't, what is healthy and what isn't on the whole, we have to wonder why the abundance of deliberately unhealthy foods and detrimental industrial methods exist at all. The reasoning is that human health is not the pursuit of industrial food production and never has been due to the isolated interest to generate income. More on this incentive disorder inherent to the market economy in later essays. The stress factor. Let's now consider the role of stress. 
stress has more of an effect on heart disease than previously thought and this isn't just referring to the statistical fact that lower income peoples tend to have a propensity to cope by smoking and or drinking, manifesting high blood pressure and hence disregard their bodies and well-being due to the ongoing struggle for income and survival. While those factors are clearly evident and, again, found tied to the inevitable stratification found in the market economy, the most detrimental form of stress comes in the form of psychosocial stress, meaning stress related to one's psychological connection with the social environment. Professor Michael Marmot of the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health at the University College of London directed two important studies relating social status to health. Using the British civil service system as the subject group, they found that the gradient of health quality in industrialized societies is not simply just a matter of poor health for the financially disadvantaged and good health for everyone else. They found that there was also a social distribution of disease as you went from the top of the socioeconomic ladder to the bottom and the types of diseases people would get would change on average. For example, the lowest rungs of the hierarchy had a fourfold increase of heart disease-based mortality compared to the highest rungs. Even in a country with universal health care, the worse a person's financial status and position in the hierarchy, the worse their health is going to be on average. The reason is essentially psychological as it has been found that the more stratified a given society, the worse public health is in general, specifically for the lower classes. This pattern has been corroborated by many other studies over the years, including a deep collection of research organized by Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett. In their work, The Spirit Level, Why Equality is Better for Everyone, they source hundreds of epidemiological studies on the issue, outlining how more unequal societies perpetuate a vast array of public health problems, both physiological and psychological. Heart disease aside, some cancers, chronic lung disease, gastrointestinal disease, back pain, obesity, high blood pressure, low life expectancy and many other problems are also now found to be linked to socioeconomic status in the broad view, not just singular risk factors. There is a social gradient in health quality across society and where we are placed in relation to other people has a powerful psychosocial effect. Those above us have better health on average, while those below us have worse health on average. In fact, a statistical comparison of public health between countries with high levels of income inequality, such as the United States, and those with lower levels of income inequality, such as Japan, reveals these truths quite obviously. However, such generally deemed physical illnesses are only part of the public health crisis generated by inequality that, again, is yet a consequence unto itself originating out of the direct, immutable stratification inherent to our global social system. Psychological health. Perhaps more profound in its public health implication is the result of social inequality on our mental or psychological health. This extends into behavioral reactions and tendencies such as acts of violence or abuse, along with emotional issues like depression, anxiety, and personality disorders. A general trend assessment of depression and anxiety in developed countries, countries that many intuitively would think would have more joy and ease due to the material wealth available reveals a much different reality. A British study examining depression among people in their 20s found that it was twice as common in 1970 than it was in 1958. An American study of about 63,700 college students found that five times as many young adults are dealing with higher levels of anxiety than in the late 1930s. A 2011 study presented at the American Psychological Association showed that mental illness was more common among college students than it was a decade ago. Psychologist Jean Twenge of San Diego University located 269 related studies measuring anxiety in the United States sourced between 1952 and 1993, and the aggregate assessment shows a dramatically clear trend in the rise of anxiety over this period, with, for example, the conclusion that by the late 1980s the average American child was more anxious than child psychiatric patients in the 1950s. A 2011 NCHS report revealed that the rate of antidepressant use in America among teens and adults, people ages 12 and older, increased by almost 400% between 1988 to 1994 and 2005 to 2008. Antidepressants were the third most common prescription medication taken by Americans in 2005 to 2008. While a genetic component for depression may have relevance, the trend rate clearly shows an environmental causality as the driving force. In the words of Richard Wilkinson, 
although people with mental illness sometimes have changes in the levels of certain chemicals in the brain, nobody has shown that these are causes of depression, rather than changes caused by depression, although some genetic vulnerability may underlie some mental illness, this can't by itself explain the huge rises in illness in recent decades our genes cannot change that fast. It appears our relative social status has a profound effect on our mental well-being and this tendency can also be found in what could be declared as the evolutionary psychology of similar primates as well. A 2002 study performed with macaque monkeys found that those who were subordinate slash lower in a given social hierarchy had less dopamine activity than the dominant ones and this relationship would change as different sets were regrouped. In other words, it had nothing to do with their specific biology, only the social arrangement that reduced or elevated their dopamine levels. It also found that lower hierarchy monkeys would use more cocaine to compensate. This is revealing as low dopamine levels in primates, including humans, are found to have a direct correlation to depression. The pattern has become very clear and while direct stressors such as job security, debt and other largely economic factors inherent to the social system may play a major role, the relevance of socioeconomic status itself is still dominant. The following chart is a comparison of overall mental health and drug use by country. It includes nine countries sourcing data from WHO surveys, including anxiety disorders, mood disorders, impulsive disorders, addictions and others. One can clearly see that the United States, which also has the highest level of inequality, has an enormous level of mental health and drug disorders as well in comparison to the less stratified countries, with Italy being the lowest in mental health disorders of the group. Even perceived social status, such as the caste relationships found in countries like India, can have a profound effect on confidence and behavior. A study performed in 2004 compared the problem-solving abilities of 321 high-caste Indian boys against those of 321 low-caste Indian boys. The results demonstrated that when caste was not publicly announced before the problem-solving began, both sets of boys achieved similar results. The second round, before which the caste of each group was publicly announced, the lower caste group fared much worse, and the higher caste much better, producing very divergent data compared with the first round. People are greatly influenced by their perceived status in their society and often when we expect to be viewed as inferior, very often we perform as such. In conclusion to this subsection regarding the psychosocial, inequality-based phenomenon that shows a clear relationship to psychological well-being, it is important to quickly make clear the vast range of issues found related. When it comes to education, social capital, trust, obesity, life expectancy, teen birth, imprisonment and punishment, social mobility, opportunity, and even innovation, countries with less income inequality do better than those with more income inequality. Put another way, they are more healthy societies. Case study, behavioral violence. Coupled with the above issues relating to inequality in society, there is one that deserves a deeper look, behavioral violence. Criminal psychologist Dr. James Gilligan, former head of the Center for the Study of Violence at Harvard Medical School, wrote a definitive treatment on the subject in his work Violence, Our Deadly Epidemic and Its Causes. Dr. Gilligan makes it very clear that extreme forms of violence are not random or genetically induced, but rather complex reactions that originate from stressful experiences, both in the long and short term. For example, child abuse, both physical and emotional, along with increasingly difficult levels of personal stress, have a direct correlation to both premeditated and impulsive acts of violence and while men have a statistically higher propensity towards violence due to largely endocrinological characteristics that, while not causing violent reactions, can exaggerate them upon the stress influence. The common theme is the influence of the environment and culture. This is not to discount the relationship of hormones or even possibly genetic propensities, but to show that at the origin of this behavior is clearly not our biology, but the condition upon which a human exists and the experience is endured. Other common assumptions of causality, such as instinct, are also far too abstract and vague to hold any operational validity. Dr. Gilligan states, I am suggesting that the only way to explain the causes of violence so that we can learn how to prevent it is to approach violence as a problem in public health and preventive medicine, and to think of violence as a symptom of life-threatening pathology, which, like all form of illness, has an etiology or cause, a pathogen. In Dr. Gilligan's diagnosis he makes it very clear that the greatest cause of violent behavior is social inequality, 
highlighting the influence of shame and humiliation as an emotional characteristic of those who engage in violence. Thomas Sheff, emeritus professor of sociology in California, stated that shame was the social emotion. Shame and humiliation can be equated with the feelings of stupidity, inadequacy, embarrassment, foolishness, feeling exposed, insecurity and the like, all largely social or comparative in their origin. Needless to say, in a global society with not only growing income disparity but inevitably self-worth disparity since status is touted as directly related to our success in our jobs, bank account levels and the like it is no mystery that feelings of inferiority, shame and humiliation are staples of the culture today. The consequence of those feelings have very serious implications for public health, as noted before, including the epidemic of the behavioral violence we now see today in its various complex forms. Terrorism, local school and church shootings, along with other extreme acts that simply did not exist before in the abstractions they find context today, reveals a unique evolution of violence itself. Dr. Gilligan concludes, if we wish to prevent violence, then, our agenda is political and economic reform. The following chart shows rates of homicide across wealthy nations, with varying states of social inequality. The United States, which is likely the largest anti-socialist advocate with little structural safeguards in place, such as a lack of universal health care, while also pushing the psychological ethic that independence and competition are the most important ethos, shows a massive level of violence. While debates over gun control and the like still persist in the American political landscape with respect to the epidemic, clearly that has nothing really to do with causality. In conclusion, this essay has attempted to give a concise overview of core causal relationships to human health on both the psychological level and the physiological level. The theme is how the socioeconomic condition in general improves or worsens public health overall, alluding to ideal conditions which would improve happiness, reduce general disease and alleviate epidemic behavioral problems, such as violence. While direct economic relationships are very clear in how they reduce human health and well-being in the form of absolute deprivation, such as an inability to obtain quality food, labor-related time restraints that reduce emotional and developmental support for children, loss of education quality due to regional funding problems, along with case-by-case -case turmoil such as the fact that most marriages end due to monetary problems, the relative deprivation issue has been more of a focus here due to the fact that it is less understood and more relevant than most understand. Put into the structural, socioeconomic context, these realities firmly challenges the ethos that competition, class and other capitalist notions of incentive and progress are drivers of social progress and health. The more we learn about this phenomenon, the stronger the argument becomes that the nature of our socioeconomic system is somewhat backwards in its focus and intent. Human progress, health and success are clearly not defined by the constant influx of market goods, gadgets and material creations for purchase. Public health and well-being are based on how we relate to each other and the environment as a whole and market-induced stratification is extremely caustic to society. The result is a hidden form of violence against the population and hence the public health issues we see are really civil and human rights issues, since they simply do not need to exist. When we see clear genocide in the world, we object strongly on purely moral grounds. But what if there existed a constant genocide that is unseen but very real, perpetuated not by a specific person or group, but by disorder born out of stress-slash-effects generated by the traditional method of human interaction and economic ordering that has been created and codified? As will be argued in the following essays, mere adjustments to the current socioeconomic system are not enough in the long term to substantially resolve these problems. The very foundational principles of our current model are bound by hierarchical economic and competitive orientations, and to truly work to remove those attributes and consequences is to completely transform the entire social system. History of Economy it is a telling symptom of our condition that no established school, discipline or general theory of social analysis has grounded itself in life requirements. Instead, some social construct is invariably adopted as the ultimate reference body set of ideas, the state, the market, a class, technological development, or some other factor than the life ground itself. John McMurtry Overview Economics is likely the most critical, relevant and influential societal characteristic there is. 
Virtually every aspect of our lives, often without conscious recognition, has a relationship to the historical development and present practice of economic thought on one level or another, molding our most basic social institutions, core beliefs and values. In fact, the very essence of how we as a society think about our relationship to each other and the habitat that supports us is, in large part, a direct result of the economic theories and practices we perpetuate. Thoughtful review of historical religious and moral philosophies, governmental development, political parties, legal statutes and other social contracts and beliefs that comprise a given social system and its culture, reveal the deep impact economic assumptions have and continue to have in shaping of the zeitgeist of a time. Slavery, classism, xenophobia, racism, sexism, subjugation and many other divisive and exploitative notions still common to human cultural history will be found to have kernels of origin or perpetuation in many generally accepted economic philosophies to one degree or another. History is fairly clear with respect to how the social condition is groomed by the prevailing economic assumptions of a given period and this broad sociological consideration is sadly not given much gravity in the world today when thinking about why the world is the way it is and why we think the way we do. As a preliminary point, a point which will re-emerge later in this essay, there has commonly been a duality noted in most modern economic thought where the capitalist free market meaning the free actions of independent producers, labor and traders, working in aggregate to buy, sell and employ, is to be contrasted to that of the state, meaning a unified system of delegated power that has the capacity to set legal policy and economic mandates that can inhibit the actions of the free market through interference. Most economic debates today revolved around this duality on one level or another with the laissez-faire interests, or those who wish to have a completely non-regulated market economy, constantly at war with the statists, or those who think some kind of centralized government control and decision-making over economic planning and policy is best. The zeitgeist movement takes neither side, even though many who hear TZM's proposals have a knee-jerk reaction to assume the latter association, statism. As with many traditionalized belief systems, polarized perspectives and defenses are common and the idea that there is no other possible frame of reference with respect to how an economic system can be developed and administered, is to close oneself off dogmatically to many relevant and emerging considerations. The following, brief treatment is about the historical development of economics. We will trace the general history of economic thought from roughly the 17th century onward, highlighting the core influences that gave birth to the modern, free-market capitalist system. However, as will be expanded upon more so in Part 3, a different perspective will also be alluded to. We will call this the mechanistic view. The mechanistic perspective of economic factoring takes a different look at the causal, scientific realities of human existence and our habitat and builds a model of economic theory from the standpoint of strategic reason, not historical tradition. The bottom line is that modern economic thought is really not modern at all and the vast majority of assumptions still held as given, such as property, money, classism, theories of value, capital and other concepts that run through virtually all contextually relevant historical arguments, are really outdated in their underlying premises. Rapid development in the industrial, informational and human sciences, which have gone largely ignored by the established economic tradition, are posing critical reconsiderations and new relationships which simply do not exist in the traditional models. With respect to the ever-mutating schools of thought that have brought the economic debate to where it rests today, the academic, often formulaic traditionalized evolution of established economic theory, and practice, appears to have developed a self-referring frame of reference. In other words, the most common mainstream economic considerations discussed slash accepted today, those most propagated in the prestigious academic schools and governmental conferences, will be found to derive their importance from the mere fact that they have been considered important for so long. As a metaphor, it is similar to viewing the engine of an automobile and assuming the overall structure of that engine is immutable and only variation among existing component parts is possible as opposed to the radical idea of redesigning the entire engine structure from the ground up, perhaps based upon new technology and information that serves the utility more efficiently and successfully. Modern economic thought and practice is an old engine with generations of imminent experts working to administer old components parts, refusing to accept the possibility that the entire engine is outdated and perhaps increasingly detrimental. 
they continue to publish arguments, theories and equations that reinforce the false importance of that old engine, old frame of reference, ignoring new advents in science, technology and public health that contradict their traditionalism. It is no different than the long history of other established ideas, such as abject human slavery, where the society at large really didn't question the practice, and considered such established structures, imposed and codified, as natural to the human condition. Underlying Themes Taking an historical perspective, Europe of the Middle Ages is generally a decent ideological starting point as the most central ideas characteristic of modern capitalism, which later spread across the world, appear to have taken hold during this period. It is from the 17th century onward that we find most of the influential philosophers highly regarded today in traditional history books of economics. While historians have found that the basic gestures of property and the act of trading for profit go back to the second millennium BC, its core developmental foundation and institutionalization appears to rest around the late feudal-slash-early mercantilist periods. Rather than discuss the various differences between the socioeconomic systems that preceded modern capitalism, it is more worthwhile to note the general similarities. In this broad context, the capitalist system appears to be a manifest evolution of what are mostly deeply ingrained historical assumptions of human nature and human social relations. Firstly, it will be noticed throughout this evolution that a class divide has been recognized and employed to one degree or another. People have generally been divided into two groups, those that produce for minimal reward and those who gain from that production. From ancient Egyptian slavery, to the peasant farmer toiling in subsistence for his lord in medieval feudalism, to the codified oppression of the market merchants by the state monopolies of mercantilism, the theme of inequality has been very clear and consistent. A second feature held in common to these dominant Western socioeconomic philosophies is that of a basic disregard, or perhaps ignorance, of critical relationships between the human species and its governing, supportive habitat. While certain exceptions can be found with indigenous tribes such as with pre-colonial, Native American societies, Western economic thought has been almost devoid of such considerations, absent the more recent and mounting ecological problems which have forced some public-slash-government response and a very general interest in reform. A third and final broad feature to note is the general dismissal of the social recognition of a person's well-being on the level of human need, and hence public health. Advancements in the human sciences, which occurred largely after the core doctrines of economic thought were traditionally codified, have found that human wants and human needs are not the same and the deprivation of the latter can create many negative consequences not only for the individual but for the society itself. Antisocial, criminal and violent behavior, for example, have been found source to many forms of social deprivation rooted in the socioeconomic tradition. Put more generally, the system ignores such social consequences by design, relegating these outcomes as mere externalities in most cases. This reality was further compounded in the 18th century where the socially Darwinistic undertone of the labor for award premise increasingly reduced the human being to an object that was to be defined and qualified by his or her contribution to the system of labor. If the average person is unable to obtain labor or engage successfully in the market economy, there exists no real safeguard with respect to one's survival or well-being, except for interference coming from the state in the form of welfare. In the modern day, this reality is of great controversy where the claim of socialism has become a knee-jerk condemnation reaction whenever governmental policy attempts to provide direct support for a citizenry without full use of the market mechanism. Dawn of Market Capitalism Medieval feudalism, roughly from the 9th to 16th centuries, was the dominant socioeconomic system that essentially preceded free market capitalism in Western Europe, with what was later to be called mercantilism serving as what could be considered a transition stage. Feudalism was based on a system of mutual obligations and services going up and down a set social hierarchy, with the entire social system resting essentially on an agricultural foundation. Medieval society was mostly an agrarian society, and the social hierarchy was based essentially on people's ties to land. The basic economic institutions were the guilds, and if someone wanted to produce or sell a good or service, they would generally join a guild. A great deal could be stated in detail about this extensive period of history, and as with most history it is subject to various interpretations and debate. However, for the sake of this essay, we will only present a very general overview with respect to the economic transition to market capitalism. 
As agricultural and transport technology improved, the expansion of trade occurred and by the 13th century, with the advent of the four-wheeled wagon, for example, the range of market interaction rapidly increased. Likewise, increased labor specialization, urban concentrations and population growth also occurred. These changes, coupled with the resulting, increasing power of the merchant capitalists, as they could be called, slowly weakened the traditional, customary ties that held the feudal social structure together. Over time, more complex cities began to emerge which were successful in obtaining independence from the feudal lords and increasingly complex systems of exchange, credit and law began to emerge, many of which are found to mirror many basic aspects of modern capitalism. In the customary feudal system, generally the handicraft producer was also the seller to the buyer of use. However, as the evolution of the market continued around these new urban centers, the craftsmen began to sell at a discount in mass to non-producing merchants who would resell in distant markets for a profit another feature later to be held common to market capitalism. By the 16th century, the handicraft industry common to feudalism had been transformed into a crude mirror of what we know today, with the outsourcing of labor, singular ownership of production, along with many finding themselves more and more in the position of being employed rather than producing themselves. Eventually, the logic surrounding monetary profit began to be the core, deciding factor of overall action in a systemic way and the true seeds of capitalism took root. Mercantilism, which essentially dominated Western European economic policy from the 16th to the late 18th centuries, was characterized by state-driven trade monopolies to ensure a positive balance of trade, coupled with many other extensive regulations for production, wages and commerce emerging over time, further increasing the power of the state. Collusion between the state and these emerging industries were common and many wars occurred due to these practices since it was based on trade restrictions between nations that often took the effect of economic warfare. Adam Smith, who will be discussed later in this essay, wrote an extensive criticism of mercantilism in his classic 1776 text, An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. It is here where it could be declared that the ideological birth of free market capitalism really took root in theory, with the rejection of what is often called state capitalism in modern terms, where the state interferes with the freedom of the market a defining feature of mercantilism. Today, capitalism, as a singular term, is generally defined culturally in the theoretical context of free market not state capitalism, although many will argue in great detail as to which type of system we really have today, among other variations of the term. In reality, there is no pure free market or state-based system in existence, but a complex fusion between the two, generally speaking. Again, as noted at the beginning of this essay, the vast majority of economic debates and blame regarding economic unfolding often revolve around these polarized ideas. Capitalism defined Capitalism as we know it in specifics today, including not only its economic theory but powerful political and social effects, emerged in form, as noted, rather slowly over a period of several centuries. It should be stated up front that there is no complete agreement amongst economic historians slash theorists as to what the essential features of capitalism really are. We will, however, reduce its historical characterization, which some will likely find debatable, to four basic features. Market-based production slash distribution, commodity production is based around rather complex interrelationships and dependencies that do not involve direct personal interactions between producers and consumers. Supply and demand is mediated by the market system. Private ownership of production means, this means that society grants to private persons the right to dictate how the raw materials, tools, machinery, and buildings necessary for production can be used. Decoupling of ownership and labor, in short, a constant class divide is inherent where on the top level, capitalists, by historical definition, own the means of production, but yet have no obligation to contribute to production itself. The capitalist owns everything produced by the laborers, who only own their own labor, by legal authority. Self-maximizing incentive assumed, individualistic, competitive and acquisitive interests are necessary for the successful functioning of capitalism since a constant pressure to consume and expand is needed to avoid recessions, depressions and other negatives. In many ways, this is the rational behavioral view held where if all humans acted in a certain assumed way, the system would function without inhibition. Locke, Evolution of Property 
A deep philosophical undercurrent to the capitalist system is the notion of property. English philosopher John Locke, 1632-1704, is a pivotal figure. Also sourced in Adam Smith's more influential Wealth of Nations, Locke not only defines the idea in general, he presents a subtle yet powerful contradiction. In Chapter 5, entitled Property, of Locke's Second Treatise of Government, published in 1689, he poses an argument with respect to the nature of property and its appropriation. He states, the labor of his body and the work of his hands, we may say, are strictly his. So when he takes something from the state that nature has provided and left it in, he mixes his labor with it, thus joining to it something that is his own, and in that way he makes it his property. This statement, supporting in gesture what was later to associate with the labor theory of value, proposes the logic that since labor is owned by the laborer, since he owns himself, any energy expelled through his labor transfers that ownership to the product made. His philosophical disposition is essentially derived from a Christian perspective, stating, God gave the world to men in common, but since he gave it to them for their benefit and for the greatest conveniences of life they could get from it, he can't have meant it always to remain common and uncultivated. Given this declaration of the common nature of the earth and its fruits to all of humanity before its cultivation via appropriation in the form property, he also derives that owners are required to not allow anything to spoil, nothing was made by God for man to spoil or destroy. And they must leave enough for others, this appropriation of a plot of land by improving it wasn't done at the expense of any other man, because there was still enough, and as good, left for others. These values, in simplistic form, seem socially justifiable in general. He makes it clear up until this point that the ownership context is relevant only in so far as the owner's needs and ability to cultivate or produce. However, in section 36, he reveals a unique reality, the implications of which Locke likely did not anticipate and, in many ways, nullifies all prior arguments in his defense of private property. He states, the one thing that blocks this is the invention of money, and men's tacit agreement to put a value on it, this made it possible, with men's consent, to have larger possessions and to have a right to them. Now, in effect, his original premise, summarized in part here, that, anyone can through his labor come to own as much as he can use in a beneficial way before it spoils, anything beyond this is more than his share and belongs to others becomes very difficult to defend as money now not only allows, men, to have larger possessions, implicitly voiding in context the idea that anything beyond this is more than his share and belongs to others, it also further implies that money can buy, labor, which voids the idea that he, in this case the buyer, mixes his labor with it, thus joining to it something that is his own, and in that way he makes it his property. Finally, the proviso nothing was made by God for man to spoil or destroy is nullified with a new association that money, being gold or silver at that time, simply cannot spoil. That is how money came into use as a durable thing that men could keep without its spoiling, and that by mutual consent men would take in exchange for the truly useful but perishable supports of life. It is here where we find, at least in the medium of literary discourse, the true seat of capitalist ownership justification where the use of money, treated as an abstract commodity in and of itself, in effect, an assumed embodiment of labor, allowed an evolution of thought and practice to emerge which increasingly shifted the focus from relevant production, Locke's cultivation, to mere ownership mechanics and the pursuit of profit. Adam Smith Adam Smith, 1723-1790, is often credited as one of the most influential economic philosophers in modern history. His work, while naturally based on the philosophical writings of many before him, is often considered a starting point for economic thought in the context of modern capitalism. Reaching maturity at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, Smith lived at a time where it could be argued that the inherent features of the capitalist mode of production were becoming ever more striking, given the introduction of concentrated, centralized production factories and markets. As noted, in 1776 Smith published his now world-famous An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. Among many relevant observations, he appears to be the first to recognize the three principal categories of income at the time, a. profits, b. rents, and c. wages, and how they related to the main social classes of the period, a. capitalists, b. landlords, and c. laborers. It is worth noting that the role of landlord-slash-rent, which is seldom discussed today in modern economic treatments, 
was a common point of focus then since the pre-industrial systems were still largely agrarian, highlighting the landlords, which later dissolved into the classification of simply owners in future market theories. Smith's most noted contribution to the philosophy of capitalism was his general advocation that even though individuals might act in a narrow, selfish manner on their personal behalf or on the behalf of the class or group to which they are a part, and even though conflict, both individual or class-based, seemed to be the result of these actions, there was what he called an invisible hand that secured a positive social outcome from singular, selfish, non-social intents. This concept was presented both in his works, The Theory of Moral Sentiments and The Wealth of Nations. He stated in the latter, as every individual, therefore, endeavors as much as he can both to employ his capital in the support of domestic industry, and so to direct that industry that its produce may be of the greatest value, every individual necessarily labors to render the annual revenue of the society as great as he can. He generally, indeed, neither intends to promote the public interest, nor knows how much he is promoting it, he intends only his own gain, and he is in this, as in many other cases, led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of his intention. Nor is it always the worse for the society that it was no part of it. By pursuing his own interest he frequently promotes that of the society more effectually than when he really intends to promote it. This nearly religious ideal had a powerful effect on the post-Smith era, giving a very social vindication for the inherently self-maximizing, anti-social behavior common to capitalist psychology. This basic philosophy was to develop, in part, as the foundation of neoclassical economics, beginning in the late 19th century. Smith, knowing quite well the class conflicts inherent to capitalism, goes on to discuss the nature of how some men gain superiority over the greater part of their brethren, reinforcing what was to increasingly be considered a law of nature regarding human power and subjugation by further theorists. His view of property was in harmony with John Locke, elaborating on how society itself is manifest around it. He stated civil government, so far as it is instituted for the security of property, is in reality instituted for the defense of the rich against the poor, or of those who have some property against those who have none at all. Property, as an institution, also requires a means to justify respective value. To this end, various theories of value have been and continue to be postulated. Often sourced in origin back to Aristotle's politics, Smith's contribution is still widely referenced as a pivotal influence. In effect, Smith builds upon Locke's mixing labor premise of production slash ownership and extends from there, creating a labor theory of value. He states labor was the first price, the original purchase money that was paid for all things. It was not by gold or by silver, but by labor, that all the wealth of the world was originally purchased, and its value, to those who possess it, and who want to exchange it for some new productions, is precisely equal to the quantity of labor which it can enable them to purchase or command. Many chapters of Book I of Wealth of Nations work to explain the nature of prices slash values respective to his denoted income slash class categories of wages, rents, and profits. However, it will be found that his logic is rather circular in specifics as the price assessments are found to originate merely from other price assessments in a chain with no real starting point, other than the loose distinction of applied labor, which has, of course, no intrinsic, static monetary qualification. This problem of ambiguity in both the dominant labor and utility theories of value common to capitalist market theory will be addressed in detail later in this essay. Overall, Smith's economic theory supported laissez-faire capitalism as the highest mode of socioeconomic operation, stating that, it was a system of natural liberty and every man, as long as he does not violate the laws of justice, is left perfectly free to pursue his own interest his own way, and to bring both his industry and capital into competition with those of any other man, or order of men. This later concept, as will be argued in the essay, Value System Disorder, is a rather naive assumption of human behavior and, in effect, a contradiction in terms. Malthus and Ricardo Thomas Malthus, 1766-1834, and David Ricardo, 1772-1823, were two well-acknowledged, leading theorists of political economy of the early 19th century. They were friendly rivals by some comparison, but from the broad view of history they shared virtually the same perspective, closely tied to Adam Smith's. The late Industrial Revolution in Europe and America was a period of extensive conflict between laborers and capitalist owners. 
numerous revolts and strikes in response to abhorrent and abusive working conditions for not only men, but also women and children, were common. This gave rapid rise to the now common labor unions and a general battle between workers and owners has continued ever since. To emphasize the extent of this class warfare, in England, the Combination Act of 1799 was imposed, which basically outlawed any combination of workers to group together for power in order to, in effect, exert influence or inhibit the interests of their employers. Historian Paul Mantu, writing of this period, commented on the absolute and uncontrolled power of the capitalist. In this, the heroic age of great undertakings, it was acknowledged, admitted and even proclaimed with brutal candor. It was the employer's own business, he did as he chose and did not consider that any other justification of his conduct was necessary. He owed his employees wages and once those were paid the men had no further claim on him. It was in the midst of all this that Malthus and Ricardo invariably contextualized their economic and social views. Beginning with Malthus, his classic work and essay on the principle of population orients around essentially two assumptions. The first is that the class structure of wealthy proprietors and poor laborers would inevitably re-emerge no matter what reforms were attempted. He considered it a law of nature. The second idea, something of a corollary to first, was simply that poverty and suffering and hence economic divides were inevitable consequences of natural law. His thesis on population rests upon the very simple assumption that population, when unchecked, increases in a geometrical ratio. Subsistence increases only in an arithmetical ratio. Therefore, if the standard of living of everyone in society were increased, the vast majority would respond by increasing the amount of children they have. In turn, population outpacing subsistence would very soon push the population back to poverty. It was only through moral restraint, a social quality that he implies to belong to the more upstanding upper class, that this problem is checked by behavior. Evidently, the difference between the wealthy and the poor was the high moral character of the former and the base morality of the latter. Again, as noted prior in this essay, the intuitive cultural condition has had a great deal to do with the prevailing premises of thought that have guided economic operations into the modern day. While many today might dismiss Malthus and these clearly outdated ideas, the seeds were deeply planted in the economic doctrines, values and class relationships that occurred during and after his time. In fact, those of a more conservative mindset still commonly cite variations of his population theory when dealing with economically less developed countries. Malthus, along with Locke and Smith, also held deeply Christian convictions in their frames of reference, whether directly extracted from scripture or based on personal interpretation. Malthus frames his moral restraint with the implication that a true Christian would righteously denounce such base vices and also accept the inevitable misery necessary to keep population from outstripping resource subsistence. Likewise, just as there is enormous debate today with respect to laws pertaining to the notion and use of welfare or public aid programs to help the poor, Malthus, naturally, was a big proponent of the abolition of what were then called the poor laws, as was David Ricardo. Moving on to Ricardo, he essentially accepted Malthus' population theory and conclusions regarding the nature and causes of poverty, but disagreed with certain economic theories, such as elements of Malthus' theory of value, theory of gluts and certain class assumptions. Since most of these disagreements in detail are superfluous to this broad discussion at hand, and arguably outdated in general, Ricardo's most notable contributions to economic thought will be the point of focus. In 1821, Ricardo finished the third edition of his Influential Principles of Political Economy and Taxation. In the preface, he states his interest, the produce of the earth, all that is derived from its surface by the united application of labor, machinery, and capital, is divided among three classes of the community, namely, the proprietor of the land, the owner of the stock of capital necessary for its cultivation, and the laborers, by whose industry it is cultivated. To determine the laws which regulate this distribution is the principal problem in political economy. While critical of certain aspects of Adam Smith's labor theory of value, he still supported the basic distinction, stating, possessing utility, commodities derive their exchangeable value from two sources, from their scarcity, and from the quantity of labor required to obtain them. In common with Smith, he elaborates, if the quantity of labor realized in commodities regulates their exchangeable value every increase of the quantity of labor must augment the value of that commodity on which it is exercised, as every diminution must lower it. 
Consequently, Ricardo viewed society and the class divisions of his time from the labor perspective and it logically went that the interests of workers and capitalists were opposed. If wages should rise, he often stated, then, profits would necessarily fall. Yet, even though this disharmony alludes to an underlying interest of each class to work to gain advantage over the other for their benefit, often resulting in general imbalance in large part due to the power of the capitalist owners to control labor and set policy, coupled with the advent of mechanization, machine application, which systematically reduced the need for human labor in applied sectors, he alludes to the conviction that the theory of capitalism, if correctly applied, should always create full employment in the long run. On the specific issue of machine application displacing human labor for the advantage of the manufacturer, he states, the manufacturer, who, can have recourse to a machine which shall, lower the costs, of production on his commodity, would enjoy peculiar advantages if he could continue to charge the same price for his goods, but he, would be obliged to lower the price of his commodities, or capital would flow to his trade till his profits had sunk to the general level. Thus then is the public benefited by machinery. However, as with other aspects of his writing, contradiction is common. While maintaining the basic idea that the general public would benefit from the introduction of labor-displacing machinery under the assumption that market prices would cleanly decline and those displaced would always smoothly relocate, in the third edition of his Principles, Ricardo starts Chapter 31 by stating, Ever since I first turned my attention to questions of political economy, I have been of the opinion that, an application of machinery to any branch of production as should have the effect of saving labor was a general good, but, that the substitution of machinery for human labor is often very injurious to the interests of the class of laborers. He later requalifies the argument by stating the statements which I have made will not, I hope, lead to the inference that machinery should not be encouraged. To elucidate the principle, I have been supposing, that improved machinery is suddenly discovered, and extensively used, but the truth is, that these discoveries are gradual, and rather operate in determining the employment of the capital which is saved and accumulated, than in diverting capital from its actual employment. His general dismissal of the issue of humans being displaced by machines, later to be called technological unemployment will also be found in common with many other economists that followed him, including John Maynard Keynes, 1883-1946, who stated, in line with Ricardo's general assumption of adjustment, we are being afflicted with a new disease of which some readers may not yet have heard the name, but of which they will hear a great deal in the years to come namely, technological unemployment. This means unemployment due to our discovery of means of economizing the use of labor outrunning the pace at which we can find new uses for labor. But this is only a temporary phase of maladjustment. All this means in the long run that mankind is solving its economic problem. The subject is brought up here as an accent of focus because it will be revisited in part 3 of this text, presenting a context of technological application apparently unrealized or disregarded by the major economic theorists of modern history who, again, are often locked into a narrow frame of reference. As a final point regarding Ricardo, he is also credited for his contribution to international free trade, specifically his theory of comparative advantage, along with perpetuation of the basic invisible hand ethos of Adam Smith. Ricardo states, under a system of perfectly free commerce, each country naturally devotes its capital and labor to such employments as are most beneficial to each. This pursuit of individual advantage is admirably connected with the universal good of the whole. By stimulating industry, by rewarding ingenuity, and by using most efficaciously the peculiar powers bestowed by nature, it distributes labor most effectively and most economically, while, by increasing the general mass of productions, it diffuses general benefit and binds together, by one common tie of interest and intercourse, the universal society of nations throughout the civilized world. Theories of Value and Behavior Up until this point, the broad contributions of four major historical figures and inevitably the central characteristics inherent to the capitalist philosophy have been briefly discussed. It will be noticed that underlying these views rest assumptions of human behavior, social, class, relationships, coupled with a metaphysical market logic where everything will work out just fine if certain values and a generally selfish perspective is taken by the players of the market game, along with little restriction of the market itself. As a brief aside, nowhere in the writings of these thinkers, nor in the vast majority of works produced by later theorists in favor of free market capitalism, is the actual structure and process of production and distribution discussed.
There is an explicit disconnect between industry and business, with the former related to the technical-slash-scientific process of true economic unfolding, with the latter only pertaining to the codified market dynamics and pursuit of profit. As will be discussed more so in a moment, a central problem inherent to the capitalist mode of production is how advancements in the industrial approach, which can allow for increased problem resolution and the furthering of prosperity, have been blocked by the traditional, seemingly immutable tenets of the business approach. The latter has governed the actions of the former, to the disadvantage of the former's potential. This kind of disconnect or truncated frame of reference is also to be found in other areas of focus, such as the dominant theories of labor, value and human behavior which inevitably serve to justify the institution of capitalism. As noted prior, the labor theory of value, made popular in general by its implications via Locke, Smith and Ricardo, is a generalized proposal stating that the value of a commodity is related to the labor needed to produce or obtain that commodity. As acceptable as this idea is in general from an intuitive perspective, there are many levels of ambiguity when it comes to quantification. Many historical objections have persisted, such as how different types of labor having differing skills and wage rates could not be properly combined, along with how to factor in natural resources and working investment capital itself. The growth of capital goods in the 20th century, such as machine automation of labor, also present challenges for the rather simplified labor theory's concept of labor-derived value since, after a certain point, the labor value inherent to production machines, which today often function to produce more machines with diminishing human effort over time, presents an ever-diluted transfer of value in this context. It has been suggested by some economists today, focusing on the rapidly advancing fields of information and technological sciences, that the use of machine automation, coupled with artificial intelligence, could very well move humans out of the traditional labor force almost entirely. Suddenly, capital has become labor, so to speak. This ambiguity extends also to competing theories of value postulated by economists, including most notably what is called the utility theory of value. While the labor theory basically takes the perspective of labor or production, the utility theory takes what we could call the market perspective, meaning that value is derived not from labor but by the purpose, or utility, derived by its use, use value, by the consumer, as perceived by the consumer. French economist Jean-Baptiste Say, 1737-1832, is notable with respect to utility theory. A self-proclaimed disciple of Adam Smith, he differed with Smith on this issue of value, stating, after having shown, the improvement which the science of political economy owes to Dr. Smith, it will not, perhaps, be useless to indicate, some of the points on which he erred, to the labor of man alone he ascribes the power of producing values. This is an error. He goes on to explain how the exchange value, price, of any good or service, depends entirely on its use value, utility. He states, the value that mankind attaches to objects originates in the use it can make of them. To the inherent fitness or capability of certain things to satisfy the various wants of mankind, I shall take leave to affix the name utility, the utility of things is the groundwork of their value, and their value constitutes wealth, although price is the measure of the value of things, and their value the measure of their utility, it would be absurd to draw the inference, that, by forcibly raising their price, their utility can be augmented. Exchangeable value, or price, is an index of the recognized utility of a thing. The utility theory of value is different from the labor theory not only in its derivation of value, but also in its implication regarding a kind of subjective rationalization with respect to human decisions in the market. Utilitarianism, which has become deeply characteristic of the microeconomic assumptions put forward by neoclassical economists today, is often modeled in complex mathematical formulas in an effort to explain how humans in the market maximize their utility, specifically around the idea of increasing happiness and reducing suffering. Underlying these ideas of human behavior, as with most of economic theory itself, are, again, traditionalized assumptions. Economist Nassau Sr., 1790-1864, supported a common theme reoccurring today that human wants were infinite, what we mean to state is, that no person feels his whole wants to be adequately supplied, that every person has some unsatisfied desires, which he believes that additional wealth would gratify. Such declarations of human nature are constant in such treatments, with notions of greed, fear and other hedonistic reflex mechanisms which assume, among other things, that material acquisition, wealth and gain are inherent to happiness. 
Today, the dominant and largely accepted microeconomic perspective is that all human behavior is reducible to rational, strategic attempts to maximize either profits or gain and to avoid pain or loss. Ever-expansive utilitarian arguments of this nature continue to be used to morally justify competitive, market capitalism. One example of this is the notion of voluntarism and the suggestion that all acts in the market are never coerced and therefore everyone is free to make their own decisions for their own gain or loss. This idea is extremely common today, as though such free exchanges existed in a void with no other synergistic pressures, as though the pressures of survival in a system with clear tendencies toward basic class warfare and strategic scarcity would not generate an inherent coercion to force laborers to submit to capitalist exploitation. Overall, the utilitarian, hedonistic, and competitive and forever dissatisfied model of human nature is likely the most common defense of the capitalist system today. It is, in many ways, both a psychological theory of how people behave and an ethical theory of how they ought to behave, arguably supporting a retroactive logic that often puts market theory before human behavioral reality, conforming the latter to the former. In reality, when the utilitarian perspective is fully considered, two serious problems emerge. First, it is virtually impossible to find predictability in such pleasure and pain boundaries after a certain degree on the social level. There is no empirical means of comparing the intensity of one individual's sense of pleasure with those of another individual, beyond the very most basic assumption of wanting gain over loss. While the utility theory of value might be logical in a purely abstract, generalized view, without quantification, the mechanics of such emotional dynamics are, in reality, susceptible to severe variation. The entire life experience of a person, compared to another person, might find some very basic common ground with respect to their personal conditioning to pleasure and pain responses, but seldom will a parallel concordance be found in any detail. Since individual pleasures are deemed the ultimate moral criteria in utilitarianism, there is really no way one can make such judgments between the pleasures of two individuals. Economist Jeremy Bentham, often considered the father of utilitarianism, actually recognized this in passing, writing, Prejudice apart, the game of push-pin is of equal value with the arts and sciences of music and poetry. If the game of push-pin furnish more pleasure, it is more valuable than either. The second problem is the short-sighted nature of the assumed emotional reaction. Human beings have historically expressed the rational interest to suffer in the present in order to gain, or hope to gain, in the future. Altruism, which has undergone extensive philosophical debate, might very well be rooted in forms of pleasure obtained by the selfless, painful, acts for the benefit of others. As will be discussed later, the pain-slash-pleasure premise put forward by such arguments, reinforced by an impulsive reaction for gain, has become a socially rewarded pattern. This has generated a mentality where short-term gain is sought after often at the true expense of long-term suffering. Yet, in abstraction, utilitarianism also offers a bizarre kind of equalizer, since it can be identified with the perspective of mutual exchange and hence a way to always see capitalism as a system of social harmony, rather than of warfare. Coming back to the labor theory versus the utility theory of value, the former clearly shows conflict as the labor theory takes into account the cost efficiency sought by the capitalist, at the expense of wages for the laborers. The utility theory, on the other hand, removes these ideas overall and states that everyone is seeking the same thing and therefore, structure aside, everyone is equal. In other words, all exchanges become mutually beneficial to everyone in a narrow, absurdly abstract generalized logic. All human actions are reduced to this system of exchange and hence all political or social distinctions disappear in theory. The Socialist Uprising Socialism, like capitalism, has no universally accepted definition in general public conversation but is often technically defined as an economic system characterized by social ownership of the means of production and cooperative management of the economy. The root of socialist thought appears to go back to 18th century Europe, with a complex history of reformers working to challenge the emerging capitalist system. Gracchus Babeuf, 1760-1797, is a notable theorist in this area, with his Conspiracy of Equals which attempted to topple the French government. He stated society must be made to operate in such a way that it eradicates once and for all the desire of a man to become richer, or wiser, or more powerful than others. 
French socialist anarchist Pierre Joseph Proudhon, 1809-1865, is famous for declaring that property is theft in his pamphlet An Inquiry into the Principle of Right and of Government. By the early 19th century, socialist ideas were expanding rapidly, commonly in response to perceived moral and ethic problems inherent to capitalism, such as class imbalance and exploitation. The list of influential thinkers is vast and complex, so only three individuals, noting their most relevant contributions, will be discussed here, William Thompson, Karl Marx, and Thorstein Veblen. William Thompson, 1775-1833, was a powerful influence on socialist thought. He was in support of the idea of cooperatives, made famous by Robert Owen as something of an alternative to the capitalist business model and philosophically took a utilitarian perspective when it came to human behavior. He was very influenced by Bentham, but his use-slash-interpretation of utilitarianism was rather different. For instance, he believed that if all members of society were treated equally, rather than engage class warfare and exploitation, they would have equal capacities to experience happiness. He argued extensively for a kind of market socialism, where egalitarianism and equality prevailed in his famous an inquiry into the principles of the distribution of wealth most conducive to human happiness. He made it clear that capitalism was a system of exploitation and insecurity, stating, the tendency of the existing arrangement of things as to wealth is to enrich a few at the expense of the mass of producers, to make the poverty of the poor more hopeless. However, he went on to recognize that even if such a hybrid of capitalism and socialism did emerge, the underlying premise of competition was still a serious problem. He wrote at length about the problems inherent to the nature of market competition, outlining five issues that have been common rhetoric of socialist thought ever since. The first problem was that every laborer, artisan and trader, viewed, a competitor, a rival and every other, and each viewed, a second competition, a second rivalship between, his or her profession, and the public. He went on to state it would be in the interest of all medical men that diseases should exist and prevail, or their trade would be decreased ten, or one hundred, fold. The second problem was the inherent oppression of women and distortion of the family, noting that the division of labor and overarching ethic of competitive selfishness further secured the drudgery of women in the household and gender inequality. The third problem associated with competition was the inherent instability generated in the economy itself, stating, the third evil here imputed to the very principle of individual competition is, that it must occasionally lead to unprofitable or injudicious modes of individual exertion, every man must judge for himself as to the probability of success in the occupation which he adopts. And what are his means of judging? Everyone, doing well in his calling, is interested in concealing his success, lest competition should reduce his gains. What individual can judge whether the market, frequently at a great distance, sometimes in another hemisphere of the globe is overstocked, or likely to be so, with the article which inclination may lead him to fabricate, and should any error of judgment, lead him into an uncalled for, and, therefore, unprofitable line of exertion, what is the consequence? A mere error of judgment may end in severe distress, if not in ruin. Cases of this sort seem to be unavoidable under the scheme of individual competition in its best form. The fourth problem noted is how the selfish nature of the competitive market presented insecurity around core life support consequences, such as security in old age, sickness, and from accidents. The fifth problem, denoted by Thompson regarding market competition, was that it slowed the advancement of knowledge. Concealment, therefore, of what is new or excellent from competitors, must accompany individual competition, because the strongest personal interest is by it opposed to the principle of benevolence. Karl Marx, 1818-1883, along with many others, was influenced by Thompson's work and is likely one of the most well-known economic philosophers today. With his name often used in a derogatory manner to gesture the perils of Soviet communism or totalitarianism, Marx is also likely the most misunderstood of all popularized economists. While most famous in the general public mind for presenting treatises on socialist-communist ideas, Marx actually spent most of his time on the subject of capitalism and its operations. His contribution to understanding capitalism is more vast than many realize, with many common economic terms and phrases used today in conversations about capitalism actually finding their root in Marx's literary treatments. His perspective was largely historical, and featured particularly detailed scholarship about the evolution of economic thought. 
Due to the immense size of his work, only a few influential issues will be addressed here. One issue to denote was his awareness of how the capitalist characteristic of exchange was principled as the ultimate basis for social relationships. He stated in his Grundris, indeed, insofar as the commodity or labor is conceived of only as exchange value, and the relation in which the various commodities are brought into connection with one another is conceived of as the exchange of these exchange values, then the individuals are simply and only conceived of as exchangers. As far as the formal character is concerned, there is absolutely no distinction between them, as subjects of exchange, their relation is therefore that of equality. Although individual A feels a need for the commodity of individual B, he does not appropriate it by force, nor vice versa, but rather they recognize one another reciprocally as proprietors, no one seizes hold of another's by force. Each divests himself of his property voluntarily. Again, as noted prior with respect to the reoccurring theme of human relations and class assumptions, or denials, Marx emphasized what could be argued as three core delusions, the delusion of freedom, equality and social harmony, as reduced to an extremely narrow association around the idea of mutually beneficial exchange, which was to be the only real economic relationship by which the whole of society is to be assessed. It is in the character of the money relation as far as it is developed in its purity to this point, and without regard to more highly developed relations of production that all inherent contradictions of bourgeois society appear extinguished in money relations as conceived in a simple form, and bourgeois democracy even more than bourgeois economists takes refuge in this aspect, in order to construct apologetic for the existing economic relations. His work Capital a critique of political economy, Marx extensively analyzes many factors of the capitalist system, namely the nature of commodities themselves, the dynamics between value, use value, exchange value, labor theory and utility, along with a deep investigation of what capital means, how the system evolved and ultimately the nature of roles within the model. An important theme to denote is his view regarding surplus value, which, in gesture of Ricardo's labor theory of value, is the assumed value appropriated by the capitalist in the form of profit, which is in excess of the value, cost, inherent to labor-slash-production itself. He stated with respect to dismissing this surplus origin in exchange, turn and twist then as we may, the fact remains unaltered. If equivalents are exchanged, no surplus value results, and if non-equivalents are exchanged, still no surplus value results. Circulation, or the exchange of commodities, begets no value. He then argues, in short, differentiating between labor and labor power, with the latter, consisting of both a use value and an exchange value, that a worker is only compensated for meeting his needs for subsistence, which is represented in his wages, while everything past that value is a surplus, which theoretically translates into the profit made by the capitalist, finalized by the price markup in market exchange. This point, which he further extends in context and dynamics inherent to the circulation slash application of different forms of capital, capital defined still as a means of production, but in this case mostly in its monetary form, poses the conclusion that an exploitation of the workers was inherent to the creation of surplus value or profit. In other words, by implication, this was a form of basic inequality built into the capitalist system and as long as one small group of owners controlled the surplus value created by the working class, there will always be rich and poor, wealth and poverty. Marx further extends this idea to a reassessment of property, which was essentially now the legal foundation of capital itself, explicitly allowing for the coercive expropriation of surplus labor, that part of labor which generates the surplus value, stating, at first the rights of property seem to us to be based on a man's own labor. At least, some such assumption was necessary since only commodity owners with equal rights confronted each other, and the sole means by which a man could become possessed of the commodities of others, was by alienating, giving up, his own commodities, and these could be replaced by labor alone. Now, however, property turns out to be the right, on the part of the capitalist, to appropriate the unpaid labor, surplus labor, of others or its product and to be the impossibility on the part of the laborer, of appropriating his own product. The separation of property from labor has become the necessary consequence of a law that apparently originated in their identity. Marx develops these kinds of arguments extensively in his writing, including the idea that working-class labor cannot be voluntary in this system only coercive since the ultimate decision to apply labor for a wage was in the hands of the capitalist.
He stated, the worker therefore only feels himself outside his work, and in his work feels outside himself. He is at home when he is not working, and when he is working, he is not at home. His labor is therefore not voluntary, but coerced, it is forced labor. It is therefore not the satisfaction of a need, it is merely a means to satisfy needs external to it. In the end, it was this complex, multifaceted degradation, exploitation and dehumanization of the average worker that bothered him so and pushed him toward reform. He even invented a phrase, the law of the increasing misery, to describe how the general working population's happiness was inverse to the accumulation of wealth for the capitalist class. In the end, Marx was convinced that pressures inherent to the system would push the working class to revolt against the capitalist class, allowing for a new socialist mode of production where, in part, the working class operated for their own benefit. Thorstein Veblen, 1857-1929, will be the final so-called socialist whose influential ideas regarding the development and flaws of capitalism will be explored here. Like Marx, he had the advantage of time with respect to the digestion of economic history. Veblen taught economics at a number of universities during his time, prolifically producing literature on various social issues. Veblen was very critical of the neoclassical economic assumptions, specifically regarding the applied utilitarian ideas of human nature, seeing the idea that all human economic behavior was to be reduced to a hedonistic interplay of self-maximization and preservation as absurdly simplistic. He took what we could call an evolutionary view of human history, with change defined by the social institutions that took hold or were surpassed. He stated with respect to the current, what he deemed materialistic, state of the time, like all human culture this material civilization is a scheme of institutions, institutional fabric and institutional growth. The growth of culture is a cumulative sequence of habituation, and the ways and means of it are the habitual response of human nature to exigencies that vary incontinently, cumulatively, but with something of a consistent sequence in the cumulative variations that so go forward incontinently, because each new move creates a new situation which induces a further new variation in the habitual manner of response, cumulatively, because each new situation is a variation of what has gone before it. And embodies as causal factors all that has been affected by what went before, consistently, because the underlying traits of human nature, propensities, aptitudes, and what not, by force of which the response takes place, and on the ground of which the habituation takes effect, remain substantially unchanged. Deblin challenged the basic foundation of the capitalist mode of production by questioning many of the factors that had been essentially given or deemed empirical by the centuries of economic debate. The now ingrained institutions of wages, rents, property, interest, labor were disturbed in their supposed simplicity by a view that none of them could be held as intellectually viable outside of the purely categorical association with extreme limits of application. He joked about how a gang of Aleutian Islanders slushing about in the rack and surf with rakes and magical incantations for the capture of shellfish are held, in point of taxonomic reality, to be engaged in a feat of hedonistic equilibration in rent, wages, and interest. And that is all there is to it. He saw production and industry itself as a social process where lines were deeply blurred, as it invariably involved the sharing of knowledge, usufruct, and skills. In many ways, he viewed such categorical characteristics of capitalism to be inherent to capitalism alone and not representative of physical reality, hence a vast contrivance. He found that the dominant neoclassical theory existed, in part, to obscure the fundamental class warfare and hostility inherent, to further secure the interests of what he called the vested interests or absentee owners, aka capitalists. He rejected the idea that private property was a natural right, as assumed by Locke, Smith and the others, often joking about the absurdity of thought that leads the absentee owners to claim ownership of commodities produced, in reality, by the labor of the common worker, highlighting the absurdity of the long-held principle that from labor, comes property. He went further to express the inherent social nature of production and how the true nature of skill and knowledge accumulation completely voided the assumption of property rights in and of itself, stating, this natural rights theory of property makes the creative effort of an isolated, self-sufficing individual the basis of ownership vested in him. In so doing it overlooks the fact that there is no isolated, self-sufficing individual, production takes place only in society only through the cooperation of an industrial community. This industrial community may be large or small, 
but it always comprises a group large enough to contain and transmit the traditions, tools, technical knowledge, and usages without which there can be no industrial organization and no economic relation of individuals to one another or to their environment, there can be no production without technical knowledge, hence no accumulation and no wealth to be owned, in severalty or otherwise. And there is no technical knowledge apart from an industrial community. Since there is no individual production and no individual productivity, the natural rights preconception reduces itself to absurdity, even under the logic of its own assumptions. As with Marx, he saw no other way to distinguish the two major classes of society than between those who work and those who exploit that work with the profit-making portion of capitalism, the business, completely separate from production itself, industry. He makes a clear distinction between business and industry and refers to the former as functioning as a vehicle of sabotage for industry. He saw a complete contradiction between the ethical intent of the general and there is no technical knowledge apart from an industrial community. Since there is no individual production and no individual productivity, the natural rights preconception reduces itself to absurdity, even under the logic of its own assumptions. As with Marx, he saw no other way to distinguish the two major classes of society than between those who work and those who exploit that work with the profit-making portion of capitalism, the business, completely separate from production itself, industry. He makes a clear distinction between business and industry and refers to the former as functioning as a vehicle of sabotage for industry. He saw a complete contradiction between the ethical intent of the general community to produce efficiently and with high service, and the laws of private property that had the power to direct industry for the sake of profit alone, reducing that efficiency and intent. The term sabotage in this context was defined by Veblen as the conscientious withdrawal of efficiency. He states, the industrial plant is increasingly running idle or half-idle, running increasingly short of its productive capacity. Workmen are being laid off, and all the while these people are in great need of all sorts of goods and services which these idle plants and idle workmen are fit to produce. But for reasons of business expediency it is impossible to let these idle plants and idle workmen go to work, that is to say for reasons of insufficient profit to the businessmen interested, or in other words, for the reasons of insufficient income to the vested interests. Furthermore, Veblen, as opposed to the vast majority of people in the modern day who condemn acts of corruption on ethical grounds, did not see any of the problems of abuse and exploitation as an issue of morality or ethics. He saw the problems as inherent, built into the nature of capitalism itself. He states, it is not that these captains of big business whose duty it is to administer this salutary modicum of sabotage on production are naughty. It is not that they aim to shorten human life or augment human discomfort by contriving an increase of privation among their fellow men, the question is not whether this traffic in privation is humane, but whether it is sound business management. With respect to the nature of government, Veblen's view was very clear, government by its very political construct existed to protect the existing social order and class structure, reinforcing private property laws and by direct extension reinforcing the disproportionate ownership, ruling, class legislation, police surveillance, the administration of justice, the military and diplomatic service, all are chiefly concerned with business relations, pecuniary interests, and they have little more than an incidental bearing on other human interests, he stated. The idea of democracy was also deeply violated by capitalist power in his view, stating constitutional government is a business government. Veblen, while aware of the phenomenon of lobbying and the buying of politicians commonly seen today as a form of corruption, did not see this as the real nature of the problem. Rather, government control by business was not an anomaly. It was simply what government had manifested to be by design. By its very nature, as an institutionalized means for social control, government would always protect the rich against the poor. Since the poor always greatly outnumbered the rich, a rigid legal structure favoring the wealthy, propertied interests, had to exist to keep the class separation and benefit to the capitalist interests intact. Likewise, he also recognized how the capitalist state government very much needed to keep social values in line with their interests, what Veblen called a pecuniary culture. Therefore, the predatory, selfish and competitive habits typical of success in the underlying social warfare inherent to the capitalist system naturally reinforced those values by default. 
To be giving and vulnerable was of little use to success in this context, as the ruthless and strategically competitive were icons of social reward. In a broad assessment, Veblen worked to critically analyze the core structure and values of the capitalist model, posing what could be argued as some profoundly sociologically advanced conclusions with respect to its inherent contradictions, technical inefficiency and value disorders. His work is very much encouraged for review by all interested in the history of economic thought, specifically for those skeptical of the premise of the free market. In conclusion, Capitalism as Social Pathology The history of economic thought is, in many ways, the history of human social relationships, with the pattern of certain mere assumptions gaining prominence to the effect of being considered sacrosanct and immutable over time. This element of traditionalism, culminating from values and belief systems of earlier periods, has been a core theme in this short review of economic history. The central point being that the attributes taken as given to the dominant theories of economy today are actually not based on direct physical support, such as would be needed to find validation via the method of science, but rather based on the mere perpetuation of an established ideological framework which has evolved to intricately self-refer to its internal logic justifying its own existence by its own standards. Today, it is not what embodies the capitalist ideology in specifics that is most problematic, but rather what it omits by extension. Just as early religions saw the world as flat and had to adjust their rhetoric once it was proven round by science, the tradition of market economics is faced with similar trials. Considering the simplicity of the agrarian and eventually primitive approaches to industrial production, there was little awareness or needed concern about its possible negative consequences over time on not only the habitat, ecological, level, but also on the human level, public health. Likewise, the market system, with its very old assumptions regarding possibility, also ignores, or even fights, the powerful breakthroughs in science and technology that express capacities to solve problems and create elevated prosperity. In fact, as will be explored in the essay Market Efficiency versus Technical Efficiency, such progressive actions and harmonious recognitions regarding the habitat and human well-being reveals that market capitalism literally cannot facilitate these solutions, since its very mechanics disallow or work against such possibilities by default. Generally speaking, the resolution of problems and hence increasing of efficiency is, in many ways, anathema to the market's operation. Solving problems in general means no more ability to gain income from the servicing of those problems. New efficiencies almost always mean a reduction of labor and energy needs, and while that may seem positive with respect to true earthly efficiency, it also often means a loss of jobs and reduction of monetary circulation upon its application. It is here where the capitalist model begins to take the role of a social pathogen not only with respect to what it ignores, disallows or fights against by design, but also with respect to what it reinforces and perpetuates. If we go back to Locke's statement about how the nature of money, given its tacit consent by the community, was to essentially serve as a commodity in and of itself, it is easy to see how this once mere medium of exchange has evolved into its present sociological form, where the entire basis of the market serves, in fact, not with the intent to create and assist with human survival, health and prosperity, but to now merely facilitate the act of profit and profit alone. Adam Smith never would have fathomed that in the present day, the most lucrative, rewarded fields would be not the production of life supporting slash improving goods, but rather the act of moving money around, hence the work of financial institutions such as banks, Wall Street and investment firms, firms that literally create nothing, but hold immense wealth and influence. Today, the only real value theory in place is what could be called the money sequence of value. Money has taken on a life of its own with respect to the reinforced psychology moving it. It has no direct purpose and intent but to work to manifest more money out of less money, investment. This money-seeking money phenomenon has not only created a value system disorder where this interest in monetary gain trumps everything, leaving truly relevant environmental and public health issues secondary and external to the focus of economy, its constant propensity to multiply and expand truly has a cancerous quality where this idea of needed growth, rather than steady-state balance, continues its pathological effect on many levels. Much could be said about the debt system and how virtually all the countries on the planet Earth are now indebted to themselves to the extent where we, the human species, actually do not have the money in circulation to pay ourselves back from what we have borrowed out of thin air. 
The need for more and more credit to fuel the market is constant today due to this imbalance, which means, like cancer, we are dealing with an intent of infinite expansion and consumption. This simply cannot work on a finite planet. Furthermore, the scarcity-driven, competitive ethos inherent to the model continues to perpetuate divisive class warfare that keeps not only the world at war with itself via empire imperialism and protectionism, but also within the general population. Today, most walk around afraid of each other, since exploitation and abuse is the dominant, rewarded ethos. All humans have adapted in this culture, unnecessarily, to see each other as threats to one's own survival in increasingly abstract economic contexts. For example, when two people walk into a job interview, seeking life support, they are not interested in the well-being of the other, since only one will gain the job. In fact, empathic sensitivities are negative pressures in this system of advantage and go completely unrewarded by the financial mechanism. Likewise, the assumption that fairness could ever exist in such a competitive environment, particularly when the nature of winning and losing means a loss of life support or survival, is a deeply naive ideal. The legal statutes in existence that work to stop monopoly laws and financial corruption exist because there is literally no built-in safeguard for such so-called corruption in this model. As implied by Smith and Veblen in this essay, the state is really a manifestation of the economic premise and not the other way around. The use of state power for legislation to ensure the security and prosperity of one class over another is not a distortion of the capitalist system, it is a core feature of the free market competitive ethic. Many in the libertarian, laissez-faire, Austrian school, Chicago school and other neoclassical offshoots constantly tend to talk about how state interference is the problem today, such as with having protectionist import-export polices or the favoring of certain industries by the state. It is assumed that somehow the market can be free to operate without the manifestation of monopoly or the corruptions inherent to what has been deemed today crony capitalism, even though the entire basis of strategy is competitive or, in more direct terms, warring. Again, to assume the state would not be used as a tool for differential advantage, a tool for business, is absurd. In the end, these overtly and unnecessarily selfish values have been at the root of human conflict since their inception and, as noted, the historical notion of human warfare on the class level is seen by most as given, natural or immutable. In the existing social model, extracted from an inherently scarcity-driven, xenophobic and racist frame of reference, there is no such thing as peace or balance. It simply isn't possible in the capitalist model. Likewise, the illusion of equality between people in the so-called democratic societies also persists, assuming that somehow political equality can manifest out of the explicit, economic inequality inherent to this mode of production and human relations. Early in this essay, the distinction between the historical and mechanistic view of economic logic was mentioned in passing. The importance of the mechanistic, scientific, perspective, which will be explored in later essays, is critical with respect to understanding how deeply out of date and flawed the market economy really is. When we take the known laws of nature, both on the human and habitat levels, and start to calculate what our options and possibilities are, technically, without the baggage of such historical assumptions, a very different train of thought emerges. In the view of TZM, this is the new worldview by which humanity needs to align in order to solve its current, mounting sociological and ecological problems, along with opening the door to enormous possibilities for future prosperity. Market efficiency versus technical efficiency The synergetic aspect of industries doing ever more work with ever less investment of time and energy per each unit of performance has never been formally accounted as a capital gain of land-situated society. The synergistic effectiveness of a world-around integrated industrial process is inherently vastly greater than the confined synergistic effect of sovereignly operating separate systems. Ergo, only complete world desovereignization can permit the realization of an all-humanity high-standard support. Our Buckminster Fuller Overview Scientific development, while evolving in parallel with traditional economic development over the past 400 years or so, has still been largely ignored and seen as an externality to economic theory. The result has been a decoupling of the socio-economic structure from the life support structure to which we are all tied, and upon which we all depend. 
In most cases today, apart from certain technical assumptions with respect to how a system not based on market dynamics and the price mechanism could function, the most common argument in support of market capitalism is that it is a system of freedom or liberty. The extent to which this is true very much depends on one's interpretation, even though such generalized terms are often ubiquitous in the rhetoric of proponents of the model. It appears such notions are really reactions to prior attempts at alternative social systems in the past that generated power problems like totalitarianism. Hence, ever since, based on this fear, any model conceived outside of the capitalist framework is often impulsively relegated to the supposed historical tendency towards tyranny and then dismissed. Be that as it may, this underlying gesture of freedom, whatever its implication in subjective use, has generated a neurosis or confusion with respect to what it means for a species such as ours to survive and prosper in the habitat, a habitat clearly governed by natural laws. What we find is that on the level of our habitat relationship we are simply not free and to have an overarching value orientation of supposed freedom, which is then applied toward how we should operate our global economy, has become increasingly dangerous to human sustainability on the planet Earth. The difficulty of social relationships aside, humans, regardless of their traditional social customs, are strictly bound by the natural, governing laws of the earth and to stray from alignment with these is to invariably inhibit our sustainability, prosperity and public health. It should be remembered that the core assumptions of our current socioeconomic system developed during periods with substantially less scientific awareness of both our habitat and ourselves. Many of the negative consequences now common to modern societies simply didn't exist in the past and it is now this clash of systems that is further destabilizing our world in many ways. It will be argued here that the integrity of any economic model is actually best measured by how well aligned it is with the known, governing laws of nature. This natural law concept is not presented here as anything esoteric or metaphysical, but as fundamentally observable. While it is true that the laws of nature are constantly refined and altered in our understandings over time, certain causal realities have stood, and continue to stand, as definitively true. There is no debate that the human organism has specific needs for survival, such as the need for nutrition, water and air. There is no debate with respect to the fundamental ecological processes that secure the environmental stability of our habitat that must go undisturbed in their symbiotic synergistic relationships. There is also no debate, as complex as it is, that the human psyche has, on average, basic predictable reactions when it comes to environmental stressors and hence how reactions of violence, depression, abuse and other detrimental behavioral issues can manifest as a result. This scientific, causal or technical perspective of economic relationships reduces all relevant factors to a frame of reference and train of thought relating to our current understanding of the physical world and its natural, tangible dynamics. This logic takes the science of human study, hence, again, the shared nature of human needs and public health, and combines it with the proven rules of our habitat, to which we are synergistically and symbiotically connected. Put together, a ground-up, rational model of economic operation can be generalized with very little need, in fact, for the centuries of traditionalized economic theory. This isn't to say those historical arguments do not possess value with respect to understanding cultural evolution but rather to say that if a truly scientific worldview is taken with respect to what works or doesn't work in the strategy of efficiency demanded by the chess game of human survival, there is very little need for such historical reference and abstraction. This view sits at the core of TZM's reformist logic and will be reviewed again in part 3 of this text. The bottom line is that these points of near-immutable scientific awareness are almost completely without recognition in the economic model dominant today. In fact, it will be argued that the two systems are not only decoupled, they are diametrically opposed in many ways, alluding to the reality that the competitive market economy is actually not fixable as a whole, and hence a new system based directly on these natural law realties needs to be constructed from the ground up. This essay will examine and contrast a series of economic considerations from both the perspective of the market system, market logic, and this noted mechanistic or technical logic. It will express how efficiency takes on two very different meanings in each perspective, arguing that market efficiency works only to be efficient with respect to itself, using man-made rule sets related mostly to classical economic dynamics that facilitate profit and growth, while technical efficiency, referencing the null laws of nature, seeks the most optimized manner of industrial unfolding possible to preserve the habitat, 
reduce waste and ultimately ensure public health, based on emerging scientific understandings. Cyclical consumption and economic growth. Market capitalism in basic operation can be generalized as an interaction between owners, laborers and consumers. Consumer demand generates the need to produce via the owners, capitalists, who then employ laborers to perform the act of production. This cycle essentially originates with demand and hence the real engine of the market is the interest, ability and act of everyone buying in the marketplace. All recessions slash depressions are a result, on one level or another, of a loss of sales. Therefore, the most critical necessity for keeping people employed and hence keeping the economy in a state of stability or growth is constant, cyclical consumption. Economic growth, which is generally defined as an increase in the capacity of an economy to produce goods and services, compared from one period of time to another is a constant interest of any national economy today and, consequently, the global economy in general. Many macroeconomic tactics are often used during times of recession to facilitate more loans, production and consumption in order to keep an economy functioning at or ideally beyond its current level. The business cycle, a period of oscillating expansion and contraction, has long been recognized as a characteristic of the market economy due to the nature of market discipline, or correction, which, according to theorists, is partly a natural ebb and flow of business successes and failures. In short, the rate, increase or decrease, of consumption is what generates the business cycle's periods of growth or contraction, with macroeconomic monetary regulation generally increasing and decreasing ease of liquidity, often via interest rates, in order to manage the expansions and contractions. While modern, monetary macroeconomic policy is not the subject of this essay, it is worth pointing out here, as an aside, that mutual respect toward both the expansion and contraction periods of the business cycle has not existed historically. Periods of monetary expansion, often via cheaper credit, that usually correlate to periods of economic expansion, as more money is being put to use, are hailed by the citizenry as national successes for society, while all contractions are seen as policy failures. Therefore, there has always been an interest by the political establishments, who want to look good, and major, influential market institutions, protecting corporate profits, to preserve periods of expansion for as long as possible and fight all forms of contraction. This perspective is natural to the value system inherent to capitalism for pain is to be thwarted at all times, often in a short-sighted manner. No company willingly wants to downsize nor does any political party willingly want to look bad, even though traditional economic theory tells us that these periods of contraction are natural and should be allowed. The result has been, in short, a constant increase in the money supply, i.e. purchasing power and capital, during times of recession, with the end result being massive global debt, both public and private. The reality is that all money comes into existence through loans and each of those loans is made with interest attached, where the loan must be paid back with the interest fee accrued, bank's profit, meaning that the very nature of money creation automatically entails a negative balance by default. There is always more debt in existence than there is money in circulation. So, returning to the main point with respect to the need for demand slash consumption to keep the economy working, this process of exchange and general focus on growth is at the heart of the market's context of efficiency. It doesn't matter what is being produced or the effect on the state of human or earthly affairs. Those are all, again, externalities. As a concentrated example of this logic, the stock market, which is itself nothing more than the trading of money and its now numerous derivatives, generates enormous GDP and growth through resultant sales slash profit. Yet, these acts arguably produce nothing of tangible, life-supporting value. The stock market system and the now massively powerful financial institutions are completely auxiliary to the real, producing economy. While many argue that these investment institutions facilitate businesses and jobs with their application of capital, this act is, once again, only systemically relevant in the current system, market efficiency, and utterly irrelevant in terms of real production, technical efficiency. In short, when it comes to market logic, the more turnover or sales, the better and that is that regardless if the item sold is credit, rocks, hope or flapjacks. Any pollution, instances of waste or other such detriments are, again, external. There is no consideration for the technical role of actual production processes, strategies for efficient distribution, design applications or the like. 
Such factors are assumed to culminate metaphysically in the best interest of the people and the habitat simply because that is what the invisible hand of the market implies. Yet, the growing more with less revolution in the industrial sciences has created a new reality where the advancement of industrial technology has reversed the pattern of cumulative material effort with respect to efficiency. The logic that more labor, more energy and more resources will produce proportionally more effective results has been challenged. In increasingly more circumstances, the reduction of energy, labor and materials to accomplish certain tasks has been the outcome given our modern scientific, technical applications. For instance, satellite-based communication today, while intellectually sophisticated, embodying a great deal of evolved knowledge, is, in physical reality, rather simple and resource-efficient in comparison to the prior alternatives for communication, which in global application, involved enormous amounts of cumbersome materials, such as heavy copper wires, along with the difficult, often risky task of laying out such materials by human labor power. What is accomplished today with a set of generally small, global satellites in orbit is truly amazing by comparison. This design revolution, which gets to the heart of what true economic, technical, efficiency means, stands in direct opposition to the cyclical consumption, growth-based economic model. Again, the intention of the market system is to maintain or elevate rates of turnover, as this is what keeps people employed and increases employment and so-called growth. Hence, at its core, the market's entire premise of efficiency is based around tactics to accomplish this and hence any force that works to reduce the need for labor or turnover is considered inefficient from the view of the market, even though it might be very efficient in terms of the true definition of economy itself, which means to conserve, reduce waste and do more with less. If we hypothetically reduced our global society to a single, small island with a respectively small population, with very limited technology as compared to today, finding that only X number of food slash survival items were possible in the natural regeneration of the land, would it be a good idea to employ an economic system that sought to increase the use and turnover of the island's resources as fast as possible for the sake of growth? Naturally, the ethic of strategic use and preservation would develop as an ethos in such a condition. The idea would be to reduce waste, not accelerate it, which, again, is what the true definition of economy means, to economize. Unnecessary obsolescence, competitive and planned. When we think of obsolescence, we often might consider the rapid technological changes occurring in the world today. Every few years, it seems our communication and processing devices, namely computer technology, undergo rapid development. Moore's Law, for example, which essentially denotes how processing power doubles every 18 to 24 months, has been extended to apply to other, similar technological applications, illuminating the powerful trend of scientific advancement in general. However, when it comes to goods production, two forms of, eventual, obsolescence occur today which are not based on the natural evolution of technological capacity, but rather result from, a, the contrived, competitive rule structure of the market system, along with, b, the driving urge for market efficiency in seeking turnover and reoccurring profit. The first, a, could be called competitive, or intrinsic, obsolescence. This is obsolescence resulting from the consequential nature of a competitive economy, as each producing entity works to maintain differential advantage over another by reducing expenses in production in order to keep the price competitively low for consumer purchase. This mechanism is traditionally termed cost efficiency and the result is products that are relatively inferior the moment they are made. This competitive need permeates every step of production, with, in effect, a reduction of technical efficiency along the way be using cheaper materials, means and designs. Imagine, hypothetically, if we took into account all of the material requirements for, say, the creation of a car, seeking to maximize its efficiency, durability and quality in the most strategically optimized way, based on the materials themselves, not the cost of those materials. The life cycle of the car would then be determined only by its natural wear and tear, with a very deliberate design focus on upgrading attributes of the car when they have become obsolete or damaged by natural use circumstances. The result would be a production designed to last, hence reducing waste and invariably increasing efficacy of utility. It is safe to assume that many in the world today believe this is what actually happens in the design and production of goods, but that simply isn't the reality. 
it is mathematically impossible for any competing company to produce the strategically best good, technically, in a market economy, as the cost efficiency mechanism guarantees a less than optimal production. The second form, B, of obsolescence is known as planned and this production technique to ensure cyclical consumption gained interest in the early 20th century when industrial development was advancing efficiency at an accelerating rate, producing better goods, faster. In fact, there was not only a need to encourage more purchases by the general public, the problem of resulting increased lifespan and general efficiency of goods was also slowing consumption. Again, the more with less phenomenon was surfacing in a rapid way. Rather than allow for a good's lifespan to be determined by its natural capacity, with the logical natural law intention for it to exist as long as possible, given limited resources on a finite planet and a natural interest to save energy, both material and human, corporations decided it was instead best to create their own lifespan for goods, deliberately inhibiting efficiency for the sake of repeat purchases. In the 1930s, some even wanted to make it mandatory for all industries, legally, where life cycles were decided not by the natural state of technological ability but by the mere ongoing need for labor and increased consumption. In fact, the most notable historical example of this period was the Phoebus light bulb cartel of the 1930s where, in a time where light bulbs were able to last up to about 25,000 hours, the cartel forced each company to restrict light bulb life to less than 1,000 hours to assure repeat purchases. Today, every major manufacturer strategizes to limit good life cycles based on marketing models for cyclical consumption and the result is not only the reprehensible waste of finite resources, but a constant waste of human labor and energy as well. Outside the dynamics of the market economy, it is extremely difficult to argue against the need for optimum design of goods. Sadly, the nature of market efficiency disallows such technical efficiency by default. Property versus access The tradition of personal property has become a staple of modern culture with little financial incentive in the long run to utilize a system of sharing or access. While a few examples of community sharing of commodities do exist in the modern day, the general ethic of ownership and the inherent value-slash-investment characteristics of property itself make such approaches more costly in the long run by the user than to engage in direct purchase. From the standpoint of market efficiency, this is a good thing, as the more direct purchases of goods, the better. Generally speaking, if 100 people wish to drive a car, having 100 people purchase those cars is more efficient for the market than if 100 people shared 20 cars in a system of strategically designed access, enabling utilization based on actual use time. If we analyze patterns of actual use of any given good on average, many types of products are found to be used intermittently. Transport vehicles, recreational equipment, project equipment and various other genres of goods are commonly accessed at relatively distant intervals, making the task of ownership not only somewhat of an inconvenience given the need to store these items, but also clearly inefficient in the context of true economic integrity, which seeks a reduction of waste at all times. Every year, countless books are borrowed virtually for free from libraries around the world and returned, not only saving an enormous amount of material resources over time, but also facilitating knowledge access to those who might otherwise have no means to obtain it. Yet, this practice is a rare exception in the market efficiency-driven world today as clearly it is to the disadvantage of the market to have anything available without direct purchase on a per-person basis. However, let's hypothetically extend this idea of the sharing of knowledge to the sharing, enabled access, of material goods. From the standpoint of market efficiency, it would be extremely inhibiting. While profit would still be generated in the capitalist model by the loaning of items to people on the basis of their need, it would be enormously disproportionate when compared to the profit-slash-consumption rates of a society based on separate, personal ownership of each good. Yet, on the other hand, the technical efficiency would be profound. Not only would fewer resources need to be utilized, along with less labor power, since less of each good would need to be created to meet the use time of citizens, the availability of such goods could very well extend to many who otherwise would not have the ability to afford the purchase to begin with, only the rental fee, still assuming a market system. In this regard, the technical efficiency has two levels, environmental and social. From the environmental standpoint, a dramatic reduction of resource use, from the social standpoint, all things being equal, an increase in the access availability of such goods could also occur. 
So, from the standpoint of technical efficiency, at the deep expense of market efficiency, a shared access rather than universal property-oriented society would be exceptionally more sustainable and beneficial. Of course, such a practice would naturally challenge some deep value identifications common to the propertied culture today. Competition versus collaboration The question of society pursuing a competitive or collaborative culture has been a running debate for centuries, with assumptions of human nature common to the defense of competition. Today, economists mostly discuss competition as an incentive necessary to continue innovation, along with the generally implied assumption that there simply isn't enough to go around on this planet and hence everyone has no choice but to fight on some level, with inevitable losers. Such assumptions noted, the themed context here of market versus technical efficiency shall be explored with respect to the competitive benefits and or consequences. There are two core angles to consider, the first is, a. How competition affects industrial production itself, the second is, b. How it actually affects innovation or creative development. If we examine the layout of industrial production today, we see a complex global system of interaction, moving resources, components and goods constantly from one location to another for various production or distribution purposes. Business, in its pursuit of profit and cost efficiency, invariably seeks out inexpensive labor, equipment and facilities, at all times, to remain competitive in the market. This can take the form of local immigrant labor at minimum wage, a sweatshop production facility overseas, a relatively cheap processing factory across the country, etc. The bottom line is that from the standpoint of market efficiency, the cost-to-profit ratio is all that matters, even if the actual act of this global processing is using disproportionately wasteful amounts of fuel, transport resources, labor power and the like. The notion of proximal efficiency, meaning in this case the efficiency derived from the distance between industrial production slash distribution points, is not considered and the practice of globalization today engages in a vast amount of wasteful resource movement around the world based almost entirely on the interest of saving money, not optimal, technical efficiency. This ignoring of the importance of proximal efficiency in industrial action, whether domestic or international, is the source of some very wasteful realities. Today, industrial production is almost entirely international, especially in the technological age. The degree to which this is needed, from a technical perspective, is slight, at best. While agricultural production has historically been regional given the propensity of certain regions to produce certain types of goods, or perhaps facilitate a more conducive environment for other such cultivations, these issues are very few in proportion to the vast majority of industrial goods production, discounting as well various technological possibilities today to overcome such regional requirements. Localization, meaning the deliberate reduction of distance between and around all facets of production and distribution, is the most technically efficient manner for a community to operate, taking into account the obvious exceptions, such as how, for example, mineral extraction clearly must begin at its point of origin in the earth, etc. It is simple to see, especially with respect to modern technical applications which currently go unused how the vast majority of life-sustaining goods can be generated in close proximity overall to where they are to be utilized. As will be described in further detail in Part 3 of this text, there is a technically efficient train of thought with respect to the utilization of proximity when it comes to extraction, production, distribution and recycling slash waste disposal. The end result would be enormous levels of resource and human energy preservation, preservation of a capacity that, in fact, could be reallocated if need be to further advancing projects, rather than squandered as mere waste via the market model today. As a final note on this subject of how competition limits the technical efficiency of industrial production, increasing waste, the reality of good multiplicity is another issue. While all production by competing companies is typically oriented around historical statistics regarding what their market share is and how many goods they can sell on average, per region, the very fact of multiple corporations, working in the same genre of good production, producing nearly identical products with only mild variation, only adds to the sources of unnecessary waste. As will also be described in the next subsection, the idea of, for example, multiple cell phone companies competing for market share by mere design variation, generating consequentially relative inefficiencies in design due to different strategies to gain cost efficiency.
coupled with the general lack of compatibility of components given the financial benefit of pushing proprietary standards and system compatibilities, creates another complex web of inefficiency. Clearly, from the standpoint of technical efficiency, one collective cell phone company, working to produce the strategically best, most adaptable, universally compatible design, would not only be more respectful of the environment, it would also create a tremendous ease and use efficiency as well since the problem of seeking proprietary repair parts and overcoming compatibility problems, would be dramatically reduced. It is often argued, however, that the pursuit of competition and the product variations that arise in the quest for market share by competing businesses is a way to introduce new ideas to the public. However, such a method could also be achieved by systems of direct, mass feedback from the public with respect to what is needed, coupled with an emergent awareness campaign about what is now possible given the empirical evolution of technological advancement. The second issue here, as noted, has to do with how competition affects innovation or creative development itself. While the assumption still persists today that differential reward for one's contribution motivates other people to seek that reward, which is also a common justification of the existence of classes, modern sociological study finds a number of conflicting views. The idea that humans are motivated inherently by a need to beat others by, for example, gaining material financial rewards in excess of others, is without credible vindication, outside of the intuitive view drawn from the existing, highly competitive, scarcity-driven market condition in which humanity finds itself today, by design. However, once again, the sociological debate can be set aside as the context here is how competition relates to market and technical efficiency directly. In short, the competitive system seeks secrecy when it comes to business ideas, often universally against the open flow of knowledge. The use of patents and proprietary rights or trade secrets perpetuates not an advance of innovation as many proponents of the competitive market assume, but retardation. It is very interesting to think about what knowledge means, how it is generated, and how odd it is for anyone to rationally claim ownership of an idea or invention. At no time in human history has any singular individual culminated an idea that was not serially generated by many before them. The historical culmination of knowledge is a social process and therefore, any claim of ownership of an idea by a person or corporation is intrinsically faulty. The common semi-economic term used today is usufruct, which means the legal right of using and enjoying the fruits or profits of something belonging to another. In reality, however, all attributes of every idea in existence today, in the past and forever in the future, has without exception a distinctly social, not personal point of origin. It becomes obvious that the notion of intellectual property, meaning ownership of mere thoughts and ideas, has manifest out of the vast period of human history where one's creativity has become tied to one's personal survival. In an economic system where people's ideas have the capacity to generate income for them personally, the idea of such ownership becomes relevant. After all, if you invent something in the modern system which could generate sales and hence help your personal economic survival, it would be extremely inefficient, in the market sense of the word, to allow that idea to be open source, since others, seeking survival themselves, would likely quickly seize that invention for their own financial exploitation. It is also easy to see how the phenomenon of ego has manifest around the idea of intellectual ownership as well, since the basis of reward in such a system invariably has a psychological tie to one's personal sense of self-worth. If a person invents something, files for intellectual ownership, exploits it for profit and then manifests a large house and extensive property, his or her status as a human being is traditionally elevated as far as the standards set by culture, he, she is considered a success. Yet, if we were to think about it in general, the sharing of knowledge has no negative recourse outside of the economic premise of ownership for profit exploitation. There is nothing to lose and, indeed, an enormous amount to be gained socially by the sharing of information. Coming back to the prior example in this essay of competing cell phone companies, we will notice that within the confines of boardroom meetings where often marketers, designers and engineers consider how to improve their product in general, the sharing of their ideas is paramount. However, imagine if that meeting was extended to all competing cell phone companies at once, where not only could they remove their contrived, utility-less marketing angles devised to gain the market share of other competitors, such as aesthetic gimmickry, they could work to produce the cumulative best in concert. 
extending even more so, what if all designs were public domain in the sense that anyone in the world who had an interest to help improve an idea was able to? The schematics of a cell phone design could be posted publicly with a system of technical interaction where people from all around the world could help, if they had the ability, with the technical efficiency and utility of the design. While this is an abstract hypothetical example, it is clear that the result of such an open approach to the sharing of information could facilitate an explosion of creativity and productivity never before witnessed. As will be discussed in Part 3, the removal of the monetary market system is critical to the facilitation of this capacity. Labor for Income At the core of the market system is the selling of an individual's labor as a commodity. In many ways, the ability of the market to employ the population has become a measure of its integrity. However, the advent of mechanization, or the automation of human labor, has become an ever-increasing point of interference over time. Historically, the application of machine technology to labor has been seen as an issue of not only social progress, but also economic progress, in the market sense, mainly due to the increase in productivity. The basic assumption is that mechanization, or more broadly technological innovation, facilitates industrial expansion and hence an inevitable reallocation of labor displaced by machine into new, emerging sectors. This is a common defense. Historically speaking, there appears to be some truth to this, where the reduction of the human workforce in one sector, such as was the case with the automation of agriculture in the West, has been overcome to a degree by the advancement of other employment sectors, such as the modern service sector. However, this assumption that technological innovation will generate new forms of employment in tandem with those displaced by it, creating an equilibrium, is actually very difficult to defend when the rate of change of innovation, coupled with the cost-saving interests of business is taken into account. As for the latter, the role of mechanization from the standpoint of market efficiency exists almost solely to assist cost efficiency. Robotics in the modern day have far exceeded the physical capacity of the average human being, along with rapidly advancing calculation processes, which continue to vastly exceed human thought. The result is the ability of industry to employ machines, which invariably have more productive capacity than human labor, coupled with the extremely notable financial incentive of reduced liability for the business owners in many ways. While machines might require maintenance, they do not need health insurance, unemployment insurance, vacations, union protection and many other attributes common to human employment today. Therefore, in the narrow logic inherent to the pursuit of profit, it is only natural for businesses to seek out mechanization at all times, given its long-term cost benefits and hence market efficiency. As far as the suggestion that equilibrium will always be found eventually between new labor roles and displaced labor due to technological innovation, the problem is that the rate of change of technological development far exceeds the rate of new job creation. This problem is unique as it also assumes that human society would always want new employment roles. It is here where subjective cultural values should be considered. Given that our current sociological condition demands human employment as the backbone of market sustainability, hence market efficiency, the ethic of work and its identity associations, culturally, have perpetuated a force where the actual function of the labor role, its true utility, becomes less important than the mere act of labor itself. Just as market efficiency has no consideration for what is actually being bought and sold in general, so long as it keeps cyclical consumption at an acceptable rate, the labor roles taken on today in production are equally as arbitrary in the view of the market. In theory, we could envision a world where people are being paid to do what could be considered pointless occupations, when it comes to utility, generating high levels of GDP with virtually no true social contribution. In fact, even today we could step back and ask ourselves what the social role of many institutions really is and perhaps come to the conclusion that they serve only to keep moving money around, not to create or actually contribute anything tangible for the benefit of society. These are complex philosophical questions as they challenge dominant traditional ethics and the very nature of what progress really means in many ways. For instance, the following thought exercise is worth considering. Imagine if we were to revert our social system back to the 16th century, where many modern, 21st century, technological realities were simply unheard of. The population of that era would naturally have expectations of what would be technically possible that would be far below what is generally accepted as possible today. 
If this society was able to superimpose, overnight, the massive technological capacity of the modern era, there is little doubt that virtually everything related to the core survival of the population could be automated. The question then becomes, what do they now do with their newfound freedom? What becomes the cultural focus of their lives if the basic drudgery of fundamental survival was removed? Do they invent new jobs simply because they can? Do they elevate themselves, preserving and embodying this new freedom by altering their social system itself, removing this previously demanded labor for income requirement? These questions get to the root of what progress and personal-slash-social goals and success really are. Nevertheless, a dominant cultural value today is that of earning a living, and the application of mechanization, in the sense of market efficiency is actually a double-edged sword. While cost efficiency is inherent to mechanization and hence the general improvement of profit by reducing costs for the business owners, the displacement of human workers, known today as technological unemployment, actually works against market efficiency to the extent that those unemployed workers are now unable to contribute to the needed cyclical consumption that powers the economy, since they have lost their purchasing power as consumers. This contradiction within the capitalist model is unique. From the standpoint of market efficiency, mechanization hence poses both a positive and negative outcome in this sense and when we realize that the rate of technological change will, in all probability, displace people increasingly faster than new sectors of employment can be created, mechanization as an inhibiting factor to capitalism becomes ever more apparent. It is, in total, decreasing market efficiency in this circumstance. However, on the other hand, from the standpoint of technical efficiency, once again, we see vast improvement and immense possibilities on many levels. The production capacity enabled by this application clearly shows a powerful increase in efficiency regarding not only the effect of industrial production, but also a general increased efficiency of the goods themselves by extension of the accuracy and integrity inherent in production. Also, an implication of this new level of production efficiency is that meeting the needs of the global population was never more possible. It is easy to see that without the interference of market logic on this new technical capacity, which invariably inhibits its full potential, what could be relatively deemed an abundance of most life-sustaining goods could be facilitated for the global population. Scarcity versus Abundance Supply and demand is a common market relationship which expresses, in part, how the value of a resource or good is proportional to how much of it is in existence or accessible. For example, diamonds are considered quantitatively more rare and hence of higher value than water, which can be found in a general abundance on the planet. Likewise, certain human creations, if created in short supply, are also subject to this dynamic, even if the perception of rarity is culturally subjective, such as with a single canvas painting by a renowned artist which might fetch many, many times its actual resource value in a sale. From the standpoint of market efficiency, general scarcity is a good thing overall. While extreme scarcity is, indeed, destabilizing both for an industry or an economy as a whole, shortages, the most optimized state within which the market system can exist is in a sort of balanced scarcity pressure, hence the assurance of sales producing demand. Again, the life requirements of humans are not recognized in this equation. Meeting human needs in the form of food, housing, low-stress circumstances for mental health, etc., is utterly external here and has no direct relationship to market efficiency. Meeting human needs in a direct sense would, again, be inefficient to the market's logic as it would remove the scarcity pressure that fuels cyclical consumption. Put another way, there is a need for imbalance in order to fuel this demand pressure, and this imbalance can come in many forms. Debt, for example, is a form of imposed scarcity which puts a person in a position to which they must often submit to labor which may be of a more exploitative nature, meaning the reward, usually the wage, is grossly disproportionate to what is needed to keep a healthy standard of living in one's circumstance. In this respect, the debt system facilitates a distinct form of market efficiency as it benefits the employer since the ease of lowering wage rates, cost efficiency, naturally increases as private debt levels increase. The more in debt people are, the more likely they will submit to low wage labor and hence generate more profit for the business owners. In fact, the same logic can be applied to the use of legally unregulated sweatshop labor in the third world, which is frequently exploited by Western companies. 
Excessive work hours coupled with notoriously low wages are common yet these people have literally no choice but to submit as there are no other options for survival in their region, often due to debt resulting from austerity measures. In fact, the regulation of the money supply in total is based on a general scarcity since, as noted before, all money today is made out of debt and this debt money is sold into the market as a commodity through loans, with the markup of interest attached to generate a profit for the banks. Yet, this interest profit, which is money itself, is not created in the money supply itself. For instance, if an individual takes out a loan for $100 and pays 5% interest on the loan, that individual is required to pay back $105. But, in an economy where all money comes into existence through loans, which is the reality, only the principal, $100, exists in the money supply with the interest income, $5, uncreated. Therefore, there is always more debt in existence than there is money to pay for it. Furthermore, since the poor are responsible for taking more loans in general for their homes slash cars slash etc. Then the wealthy, who maintain a financial surplus, this overall debt pressure tends to fall on the lower classes, compounding the inherently insurmountable problem of being in debt and hence with limited options. In this model, bankruptcy, for example, is not a result of some poor business judgments it is an inevitable consequence, like a game of musical chairs. So, coming back to the central point, the reality of scarcity in the current economic system is a source of great efficiency in the market sense for if people had their basic needs met, or if they were able to meet those needs without the external pressure of irresolvable debt which keeps the imbalances cyclical consumption, profit and growth would suffer. As insidious as it may seem to our intuition and humanity, that keeping people deprived is actually a positive precondition for the workings of the market, this is the reality. Needless to say, from the standpoint of technical efficiency, seeing the human being as a biochemical machine in universal need of basic nutrition, stability and other psychosocial requirements, which, if unattained, can result in sickness, both physical and psychological, we can recognize the decoupled state of human-slash-social well-being with this market logic. As a final point on this issue, the market seeks the servicing of problems at all times. In fact, it could be stated generally that technical inefficiency is the driver of market efficiency. Problem resolution is not sought by the market as it then creates an income void and hence a loss of monetary gain and movement. The result of this, in part, is a perverse reinforcement of incentive to seek or even advance problems in general. A century ago, the idea of selling bottled water would have been strange, given its general, unpolluted abundance. In the modern day, it is a multi-million dollar industry annually, derived mostly from the water pollution that has occurred due to irresponsible industrial practices. The profit and jobs now associated with this technically inefficient reality of resource pollution and destruction, has improved, once again, the economic market efficiency needed to keep cyclical consumption going. Conclusion Market efficiency, generally speaking, takes on a macro and micro reality. On the macro scale, anything that can increase sales, growth or consumption, regardless of the originating pressure for demand or what is actually being bought and sold, is deemed efficient in this context. On the micro scale, this efficiency takes the form of enabling conditions that can increase profit and reduce input costs, cost efficiency, on the part of business. This efficiency inherent to capitalism operates without any respect for the social or environmental costs of its process to keep cyclical consumption and profit going and the world you see around you full of ecological disorder, human deprivation, and general social and environmental instability has been the result. On the other hand, technical efficiency, which one could characterize as, in fact, a hindrance to market efficiency, seeks to maintain the environment, maintain human health and essentially keep balance in the natural world. The reduction of waste, resolution of problems, and the maintaining of alignment with natural law is the common-sense logic embodied. It is unfortunate to realize that today we have two opposed systems of economy working at once, working against each other, in fact. The market system, embodying its archaic, traditionalized logic, is utterly out of sync with the natural, technical, economy as it exists. The result is vast discord and imbalance, with ever-mutating problems and consequences for the human species. It is clear which system will win in this battle.
nature will persist with its natural rules regardless of how much we theorize this or that validation of the way we have traditionally organized ourselves on this planet. Nature doesn't care about our vast monetary economic ideas, its theories of value, sophisticated financial models or detailed equations regarding how we think human behavior manifests and why. The technical reality is simple, learn, adapt and align to the governing laws of nature, or suffer the consequences. It is absurd to think that the human species, given its evolution within the same natural laws to which our economic practice and values must align, would be incompatible with such laws. It is merely an issue of maturity and awareness today. As a final point, as well as a general aside, there has emerged a trend in the 21st century, in the wake of all the growing and persisting ecological problems that claims to seek what is called a green economy. Some have even divided this economic view into sectors, including applications for renewable energy, eco-buildings, clean transportation and other categories of focus. It will be noticed that all of those awarenesses and sought applications are generally in line with the technical or scientific awareness perspective discussed in this essay. Sadly, as positive as the intent of these new organizations and business planners may be, the inefficiency inherent to the capitalist model of economics, with all its need for certain forms of contrived efficiency to maintain itself immediately pollutes and deeply limits all such attempts, which explains why such technical efficiency approaches have still yet to really be applied. The sad reality is that while some improvement can be made, such progress will be inherently limited to an ever-increasing degree since, as described, the very structural basis of the way market capitalism works is actively opposed to the efficiencies inherent in the natural law view. The only logical solution is to rethink the entire structure if any real efficiency, elevated prosperity and problem resolution is to be achieved in the long run. Value System Disorder I believe that greed and competition are not a result of immutable human temperament, I have come to the conclusion that greed and fear of scarcity are in fact being continuously created and amplified as a direct result of the kind of money we are using, the direct consequence is that we have to fight with each other in order to survive. Bernard Lee Terre Thought Genes Given the relatively slow rate of change of the human being with respect to biological evolution, the vast societal changes that have occurred over the past 4,000 years of recorded history have occurred due to the evolution of knowledge, hence cultural evolution. If we were to search for a mechanism for cultural evolution, the notion of the meme is useful to consider. Defined as an idea, behavior, style, or usage that spreads from person to person within a culture, memes are considered to be sociological or cultural analogs to genes, which are functional, biological, units controlling the transmission and expression of one or more traits. While genes basically transmit biological data from person to person through heredity, memes transmit cultural data ideas from person to person via human communication in all forms. When we recognize, for example, the power of technological advancement over time and how it has dramatically changed our lifestyles and values and will continue to do so, we can view this overall, emergent phenomenon as an evolution of ideas, with information replicating and mutating, altering the culture as time moves forward. Given this, we could gesturally view the human mental state and its propensities for action as a form of program. Just as genes encode a set of instructions which, in concert with other genes and the environment produce sequential results, the processing of memes by the intellectual capacity of human beings, in concert, create patterns of behavior in a similar way. While free will is certainly a complex debate to be had with respect to what actually triggers and manifests human decisions, it is fundamentally clear that people's ideas are limited by their input, education. If a person is given little knowledge about the world, their decision process will be equally as limited. Likewise, just as genes can mutate in ways that are detrimental to their host, such as the phenomenon of cancer, so can memes with respect to ideological-slash-sociological transmissions, generating mental frameworks that serve as detriments to the host or society. It is here where the term disorder is introduced. A disorder is defined as a derangement or abnormality of function. Therefore, when it comes to social operation, a disorder would imply institutionalized ideological frameworks that are out of alignment with the larger governing system. In other words, they are inaccurate with respect to the context in which they attempt to exist, often creating imbalance and detrimental destabilization. Of course, history is full of initially destabilizing, 
transitioning ideas and this ongoing intellectual evolution is clearly natural and necessary to the human condition as there is no such thing as an absolute understanding. However, the differentiation to be made here is the fact that when ideas persist for a long enough period, they often create emotional connections on the personal, identity, level and institutional establishments on the cultural level, which tend to perpetuate a kind of circular reinforcement, generally resisting change and adaptation. Recognizing our intellectual evolution as a process with no end and being open to new information to help better align ourselves for sustainable practices is clearly a core ethic needed both on the personal and social level if we expect to keep adapting for the better in the context of cultural evolution. Sadly, there are powerful cultural forces that work against this interest in the world today. Structures, both ideological and encoded in the current social infrastructure actively work against this critical necessity of cultural adaption. An analogy would be the starvation of our biological cells by removing oxygen from the environment, only in this case we are restricting our vulnerability to learn and adapt, with knowledge being the oxygen by which we as a species are able to solve problems and continue progress. This disorder is, as will be described, inherent to the market capitalist tradition. It is not only the actual decisions being made against the interests of adaptation, knowingly or not, that perpetuate detrimental effects on many levels, it is also the value system, the employment of identity and a normalized sense of custom, which bears a powerfully problematic force. This is compounded even more so when the purpose served, or appears to be served, by such intense directly ties to our survival and existence. There is nothing more personal to us than how we identify ourselves and the economic system we encompass is invariably a defining feature of our mentalities and worldview. If there is something wrong with this system, then it implies there is something wrong with ourselves, given that we are the ones who perpetuate it. Value System Disorder just like cancer is, in part, an immune system disorder, sociological traditions which persist with ever-increasing problem generation for society could be called a value system disorder. This disorder has to do with a kind of structured psychology where certain assumptions have been given credence over time based merely on their cultural persistence, coupled with an inherent reinforcement of itself in operation. The larger the social context of the disorder, often the more difficult its resolution, not to mention the difficulty of its mere recognition itself. On the scale of a social system, it becomes very difficult as the society as a whole is constantly being conditioned into the dynamics of its own framework, often creating powerful self-preservation reactions whenever its integrity is challenged. These, what could be called closed intellectual feedback mechanisms, are what comprise the vast majority of arguments in defense of our current socioeconomic system, just as they have in generations prior. In fact, it appears to be a general sociological trend since, again, people's very identity is invariably associated with the dominant belief systems and institutions they are born into. In the words of John McMurtry, Professor Emeritus of Philosophy at the University of Guelph, Canada, in the last dark age, one can search the inquiries of this era's preserved thinkers from Augustine to Hockham, and fail to discover a single page of criticism of the established social framework, however rationally insupportable feudal bondage, absolute paternalism, divine right of kings and the rest may be. In the current final order, is it so different? Can we see in any media or even university press a paragraph of clear unmasking of a global regime that condemns a third of all children to malnutrition with more food than enough available? In such a social order, thought becomes indistinguishable from propaganda. Only one doctrine is speakable, and a priest cast of its experts prescribes the necessities and obligations to all, social consciousness is incarcerated within the role of a kind of ceremonial logic, operating entirely within the received framework of an exhaustively prescribed regulatory apparatus protecting the privileges of the privileged. Methodical censorship triumphs in the guise of scholarly rigor, and the only room left for searching thought becomes the game of competing rationalizations. Such reactions are also common with respect to established practices in specific fields. For instance, Ignaz P. Semmelweis, 1818-1865, a Hungarian physician who discovered that puerperal fever could be drastically cut by the use of simple handwashing standards in obstetrical clinics, essentially foreshadowing the now fully accepted germ theory of disease, was shunned, rejected and ridiculed by his finding. It wasn't until long after his death, his now very basic realization was respected. 
Today, some use the phrase, the Semmelweis reflex as a metaphor for the reflex-like tendency to reject new evidence or new knowledge because it contradicts established norms, beliefs or paradigms. Overall, once a given set of ideas is entrusted by a large enough number of people, it becomes an institution and once that institution is made dominant in some way, such as existing for a certain period of time, that institution could then be considered an establishment. Institutional establishments are simply social traditions, given the illusion of permanence and the longer they persist, often the stronger the defense of their right to exist by the majority of culture. If we examine the institutional establishments we take for granted today, from macro-system attributes such as the financial system, the legal system, the political system and major religious systems, to micro-system attributes such as materialism, marriage, celebrity, etc., we must remind ourselves that none of these ideas are actually real in the physical sense. These are temporal mean structures we have created to serve our purposes given conditions at certain points in time and no matter how much we emotionally attach to such issues. No matter how large an institution may become, no matter how many people may believe in such institutions, they are still impositions of thought and transient by nature. So, coming back to the context here of the value system disorder, market capitalism, while arguably being deeply decoupled from physical reality and a root source of the vast majority of the social woes in the world today, keeps itself in place through a set of culturally reinforced values and power establishments upon which the society is ultimately conditioned and generally inclined to defend. This is made increasingly powerful in its persuasion since the dominant value system disorder at hand today is born out of assumptions relating to critical human survival itself. Characteristics of Pathology in order to critically evaluate an existing framework of thought, a basic, mutually accepted benchmark needs to be generated. Cultural relativism is an anthropological notion that refers to the fact that different cultural groups generate different perceptions of truth or reality. Moral relativism, which is a similar notion, has to do with the variance of what is considered correct or ethical. Over the course of human history, these distinctions have become increasingly narrow since the scientific revolution of causal thought, from the Renaissance onward, has increasingly reduced the relative integrity of various beliefs. The fact is, beliefs are not equal in their validity. Some are truer than others, and hence some are more dysfunctional than others in the context of real life. The scientific method of arriving at conclusions is the ultimate benchmark upon which the integrity of human values can be measured and this modern reality demystifies the common relativism defense of subjective human belief. It is not about right and wrong, but what works or doesn't work. The integrity of our values and beliefs is only as good as how aligned they are with the natural world. This is the common ground that we all share. This concept ties indirectly with sustainability in the broad context of human survival itself, as a sustainable social system naturally must have sustainable values to facilitate and perpetuate the structure. Unfortunately, the evolutionary baggage of our cultural history has maintained value structures that are so powerful, yet so clearly decoupled from reality, which our personal and societal assumptions of happiness, success and progress itself continue to be deeply perverted and exist in discordance with the governing laws of our habitat and human nature. The human being indeed has a common nature and while nothing appears 100% universal across the species, certain pressures and stressors can generate, on average, serious public health problems. Likewise, if our values support behaviors that are not in accordance with our physical sustainability on the planet Earth, then naturally we can expect ever-increasing problems on that environmental level as well. The dominant value system, which the capitalist socioeconomic model perpetuates, is arguably deeply pathological to the human condition as the mechanisms related to survival and general reward compound emotional attachments and forms of self-preservation which are essentially rooted in a kind of primitive desperation and fear. The fundamental ethos is that of an antisocial, scarcity-driven pressure, which forces all players of the game to be generally exploitative and antagonistic, both of others and the habitat. It also has built-in pressures to avoid socially easing interests due to a resulting loss of profit, furthering the stress-induced emotional disparity. The result is a vicious cycle of general abuse, narrow-minded selfishness, and social and environmental disregard. Of course, historically, these caustic characteristics are usually defended as simply the way it is as though our evolutionary psychology must be stuck in this state. 
In fact, if the touted psychological doctrines of traditional market theory hold true, neoclassical utilitarianism regarding our apparent limits with respect to a workable social structure, then imbalance, environmental destruction, oppression, violence, tyranny, personality disorders, warfare, exploitation, selfish greed, vain materialism, competition and other such divisive, inhumane and destabilizing realities are simply inalterable and therefore the whole of society should do nothing but work around such inevitabilities with whatever controls we can put in place to manage these realities of the human condition. It is as though the human being is deemed to have a severe, incurable mental disorder, a firm retardation that simply cannot be overcome, so everything in society must be altered around it in an attempt to deal with it. Yet, the more we live as human beings, the more history we are able to see of ourselves over generational time, the more we are able to compare the behaviors of different cultures across the world and across history, the more clear it becomes that our human capacity is being inhibited directly by an archaic reward and survival structure which continues to reinforce primitive, desperate values and while such values might have served a positive evolutionary role in the past, the present and foreshadowed future arguably lays these behavioral patterns bare as detrimental and unsustainable, as this overall text has expressed at length. Self-preservation paralysis. While each of us generally wishes to survive and do so in a healthy state, naturally prepared to defend that survival when need be, self-preservation in the current socioeconomic condition unnecessarily extends this tendency in ways that severely inhibit social progress and problem resolution. In fact, it could be said that this short-term preservation occurs often at the cost of long-term integrity. The most obvious example of this has to do with the fundamental nature of seeking and maintaining income, the lifeblood of the market system and, by extension, human survival. Once a business succeeds in gaining market share, typically supporting employees along with the owners, the business naturally gravitates to an interest to preserve that income-generating market share at all costs. Deep value associations are generated since the business is not just an arbitrary entity that produces a good or service it is now a means of life support for everyone involved. The result is a constant, socially debilitating battle, not only with the competitors who also seek the same consumer market, but with innovation and change itself. While technological progress is a constant, fluid progression on the scientific level, the market economy sees this emergence as a threat in the context of existing, currently profitable ideas. Vast levels of historical corruption, cartel and monopoly generation and other defensive moves of existing businesses can be found throughout history, each act working to secure income production regardless of the social costs. Another example has to do with the psychological neurosis built out of the credit-based reward incentive inherent to the market system. While it is intellectually clear that no single person invents anything given the reality that all knowledge is serially generated and invariably cumulative over time, the market economy's characteristic of ownership creates a tendency not only to reduce information flow via patents and trade secrets, it also reinforces the idea of intellectual property despite the true fallacy of the notion itself. On the value system level, this has mutated into the notion of credit entitlement and hence often ego associations to presented ideas or inventions. In the world today, this phenomenon has taken a life of its own with a tendency for many who contribute often seeking status elevating credit for the idea, even though they are, again, clearly part of a continuum larger than themselves. While appreciation for the time and labor of a given person working towards the progress of an idea is a productive social incentive and fundamental to our sense of purpose in action, the perversion of intellectual ownership and all its contrived attributes extend this operant satisfaction into distortion. In fact, on the largest scale of knowledge culmination, such acts of appreciation inevitably become irrelevant in the memory of history. Today, for instance, when we use a modern computer to assist our lives, we seldom think about the thousands of years of intellectual study that discovered the core scientific dynamics related, nor the enormous amount of cumulative time spent by virtually countless people to facilitate the invention of such a tool, in its current form. It is only in the context of manifest ego and monetary reward security that this becomes a natural value issue with respect to the market system. If people do not claim credit, they will not be rewarded and hence they will not gain survival from that contribution in the market. So, the condition has compounded this neurosis that is invariably stifling towards progress via the sharing of knowledge. Furthermore, 
disorders associated with market self-preservation can take many other forms, including the use of government as a tool, the pollution of academia and information itself, since educational institutions are supported by income as well, and even common interpersonal relationships. The fear inherent to the loss of livelihood naturally overrides almost everything and even the most ethical or moral person, when faced with the risk of non-survival, can usually justify actions that would be traditionally called corrupt. This pressure is constant and is the source, in part, of the vast so-called criminality and social paralysis we see today. Competition, Exploitation and Class Warfare Building on the prior point, exploitation, which is inherent to the competitive frame of mind, has permeated the very core of what it means to succeed in general. We see this taking advantage rhetoric in many facets of our lives. The act of manipulation and exploitation for competitive gain has become an underlying force in modern culture, extending far beyond the context of the market system. The attitude of seeing others in the world as merely a means for oneself or a particular group to conquer and keep ahead of is now a driving psychological distortion to be found in romantic relationships, friendships, family structures, nationalism, and even how we relate to the habitat we exist within where we seek to exploit and disregard the physical environment's resources for short-term personal gain and advantage. All elements of our lives are necessarily viewed from the perspective of what can I get out of it personally? A study performed at the Department of Psychology at the University of California, Berkeley, in 2011 found that upper-class individuals behave more unethically than lower-class individuals, upper-class individuals were more likely to break the law while driving, relative to lower-class individuals. In follow-up laboratory studies, upper-class individuals were more likely to exhibit unethical decision-making tendencies, take valued goods from others, lie in a negotiation, cheat to increase their chances of winning a prize, and endorse unethical behavior at work than were lower-class individuals. Mediator and moderator data demonstrated that upper-class individuals' unethical tendencies are accounted for, in part, by their more favorable attitudes toward greed. Studies of this nature are very interesting as they reveal that the common human nature argument in its extreme context, that of people inevitably being competitive and exploitative, when defending the current social system, is bypassed. Class relationships are not genetic relationships, even though the nuances of individual propensities could be argued. This study expresses a cultural phenomenon overall since it is axiomatic to assume that the general attitude of disregard for external negative consequences, or so-called unethical behavior expressed by the upper class, is a result of the type of values needed to achieve the position of actually making it to the upper class. In common poetic rhetoric, this intuition has held true for centuries, with the observation that those who achieve success in the business sense are often desensitized and ruthless. There appears to be a general loss of empathy by those who achieve such success and it is intuitively obvious why this is the case, given the value system disorder of competitive disregard inherent to the market system psychology. Overall, the more caring and empathic you are, the less likely you are to succeed financially, no different from a general sport where you are not going to help an opposing player achieve their goals for it means you are more likely to lose. Overall, the lower classes are found to be more socially humane in many ways. For example, it has also been found that the poor give a higher percentage of their income, 4.3%, to charity than rich people, 2.1%. A 2010 study found that, lower-class individuals proved to be more generous, charitable, trusting, and helpful, compared with their upper-class counterparts. Mediator and moderator data showed that lower-class individuals acted in a more prosocial fashion because of a greater commitment to egalitarian values and feelings of compassion. Implications for social class, prosocial behavior, and economic inequality are discussed. A study conducted by the Chronicle of Philanthropy using tax deduction data from the Internal Revenue Service showed that households earning between $50,000 and $75,000 a year give an average of 7.6% of their discretionary income to charity. That compares to 4.2% for people who make $100,000 or more. In some of the wealthiest neighborhoods, with a large share of people making $200,000 or more a year, the average giving rate was 2.8%. Success and status. Underlying the capitalist model is an implied assumption that those who contribute the most must gain the most. In other words, it is assumed that to become, say, 
a billionaire, you must have done something important and helpful for society. Of course, this is clearly untrue. The vast majority of extremely wealthy people originate their wealth out of mechanisms that are not socially contributive on any direct, creative level when broken down and analyzed. The act of engineering, problem-solving and creative innovation almost always occurs on the level of the laborer in the lower echelons of the corporate complex, only to be capitalized upon by those at the top owners, who are skilled at the contrived game of generating a market. This is not to discount the intelligence or hard work of those who hold vast wealth, but to show that the rewards of the system are displaced, allocated to those who exploit the mechanisms of the market, not those who actually engineer and create. In fact, one of the most rewarded sectors of the global economy today is that of investment and finance. This is a classic example as to be a hedge fund manager, moving money around for the mere sake of gaining more money, with zero contribution to creative development, is one of the highest paid occupations in the world today. Likewise, the very notion of success in the culture today is measured by material wealth, in and of itself. Fame, power and other gestures of attention go hand in hand with material wealth. To be poor is to be abhorred, while to be rich is to be admired. Across almost the entire social spectrum, those of high levels of wealth are treated with immense respect. Part of this has to do with a system-oriented survival mechanism, such as the personal interest in gaining insight into how to also become such a success, but overall it has morphed into a strange fetish where the idea of being rich, powerful and famous, by whatever means necessary, is a guiding force. The value system disorder of rewarding, in effect, generally the most ruthless and selfish in our society, both by financial means and then by public adoration and respect, is one of the most pervasive and insidious consequences of the incentive system inherent to the capitalist model. It not only works to bypass true interests in types of innovation and problem-solving which inherently do not have monetary return, it also reinforces the market system's own existence, justifying itself by way of high-status attainment for those who win in the system, regardless of true contribution or the social and environmental costs. Sociologist Thorstein Veblen wrote extensively on this issue, referring to this value virtue as predatory, as the predatory culture reaches a fuller development, there comes a distinction between employments, the honorable man must not only show capacity for predatory exploit, but he must also avoid entanglement with occupations that do not involve exploit. The tame employments, those that involve no obvious destruction of life and no spectacular coercion of refractory antagonists, fall into disrepute and are relegated to those members of the community who are defective in the predatory capacity, that is to say, those who are lacking massiveness, agility, or ferocity, therefore the able-bodied barbarian of the predatory culture, who is mindful of his good name, puts in his time in the manly arts of war and devotes his talents to devising ways and means of disturbing the peace. That way lies honor. William Thompson, in his An Inquiry into the Principles of the Distribution of Wealth Most Conducive to Human Happiness restates the reality of this associative influence, our next position is, that excessive wealth excites the admiration and the imitation, and in this way diffuses the practice of the vices of the rich, amongst the rest of the community, or produces in them other vices arising out of their relative situation to the excessively rich. On this point, nothing is more obvious than the universal operation of the most common principle of our nature, that of association. The wealth, as a means of happiness, is admired or envied by all, the manner and character connected with the abundance of these good things, always strike the mind in conjunction with them. Classes and class warfare are a natural outgrowth of this as the value associations to wealth and power manifest by the current system, become an issue of emotional identity over time. The status interest begins to take on a life of its own and it generates actions of self-preservation on the part of the upper class that seek to maintain, or elevate, their status in ways that might not even relate to money or material wealth anymore. Self-preservation, in this case, extends to a kind of drug addiction. Just as a chronic gambler needs the endorphin rush of winning to feel good, those in the upper class often develop similar compulsions in relationship to the state of their perceived status and wealth. The term greed is often used to differentiate between those who exploit modestly and those who exploit excessively. Greed is hence a relative notion, just as being rich is a relative notion. The term relative deprivation refers to the discontent people feel when they compare their positions to others and realize that they have less of what they believe themselves to be entitled to.
This psychological phenomenon knows no end and within the context of the material success incentive system of capitalism, its presence as a severe value system disorder is apparent on the level of mental health. While maintaining a needs meeting, quality standard of living is important for physical and mental health, anything beyond that balance in the context of social comparison has the capacity to create severe neurosis and social distortion. Not only is there no winning in the end when it comes to the subjective perception of status and wealth, it often serves to decouple those figures from the majority of the human experience, generating alienation and dehumanization in many ways. This empathic loss has no positive outcome on the social level. The predatory reward values inherent to the market system virtually guarantee endless conflict and abuse. Of course, the myth is that this neurosis of seeking more and more status and wealth is the core driver of social progress and innovation. While there might be some basic truth to this intuitive assumption, the intent, again, is not social contribution but advantage and financial gain. It is like saying being chased by a pack of hungry wolves ready to eat you is good for your health since it is keeping you running. While certain accomplishments are clearly occurring, the guiding force, intent, again has little to do with those accomplishments and the detrimental byproducts and larger order paralysis inherent nullifies in comparison the idea that the values of competition, material greed and vain status is a legitimate source of societal progress. In fact, epidemiologist Richard Wilkinson has extrapolated a comparison of wealthy nations oriented by the income disparity present in each population. It was found that those nations with the least income disparity actually were more innovative and when we consider that the competitive value drive has a large role with respect to how severe the gap between the rich and poor is, it is axiomatic to consider that the values of egalitarianism and collaboration have more creative power than the traditional economic incentive rhetoric would claim. As a final point in this subsection, the subject of materialism and status can be extended to the similar issue of vanity as well. While a mild deviation from our point, the vanity-based culture we have today finds a direct relationship to these drives for status and measures of success rooted in the psychological value incentives inherent to the capitalist system. Given that the value system of acquisition is, in fact, necessary for the consumption model to work, it is only natural that marketing and advertising generate dissatisfaction continually, including in the way we feel about our physical appearance. In fact, a study was conducted some years ago on the island of Fiji, in which Western television was introduced to a culture that had never experienced the medium before. By the end of the observation period, the effect of materialistic values and vanity took a powerful toll. A relevant percentage of young women, for example, who prior had embraced the style of healthy weight and full features, became obsessed with being thin. Eating disorders, which were virtually unheard of in this culture, began to spread and women specifically were transformed. Ideological polarization and blame. When the subject of what has gone wrong with the world today is broached, given the poverty, ecological imbalance, inhumanity, general economic destabilization and the like, a polarized debate often ensues. Dualities such as the right or the left or liberal or conservative are common, implying that in the range of human comprehension and preference, there is a rigid guiding line that embodies all known possibilities. Paired with this is also the older, yet still common duality of collectivism versus free market. In short, this duality assumes that all options of economic preference must adhere to the idea that society should either be based on the supposed democratic will of all the people in the form of free trade, or that a small group of people should be in control and tell everyone else what to do. Due to the dark history of totalitarianism that plagued the 20th century, a fear-based value orientation, which rejects anything that even remotely hints at the appearance of collectivism, is extremely common today, with the related word socialism often used in a derogatory way. As noted prior in this essay, people's sense of possibility is directly related to their knowledge, what they have learned. If traditional educational and social institutions present all socioeconomic variation within the confines of such boxed frames of reference, people will likely mirror this assumption, meme, and perpetuate it in thought and practice. If you are not ABC, then you must be XYZ this is the common thought meme. Even the political establishment of the United States exists in this paradigm, for if you are not a Republican, you must be a Democrat, etc. In other words, there is a direct inhibition of possibility and, in this context, it often manifests a value structure that builds emotional attachments to false dualities. 
These values are extreme barriers to progress today on many levels. In fact, as an aside, if the intention of a ruling class were to limit any interference from the lower classes, they would protectively work to limit people's sense of possibility. For example, the supposed problem of state intervention of the free market, a constant theme of capitalist apologists, essentially says that since various policies and practices of the government limit free trade in some way, this is the source of the problem generating market inefficiency. This blame game actually goes back and forth between those who claim it is the market that is the problem and those who claim it is the state's interference with the market. What isn't talked about is the duality shattering reality that the state, in its historical form, is an extension of the capitalist system itself. The government did not create the system. The system created the government or more accurately, they evolved as one apparatus. All socioeconomic systems root themselves in the basis of industrial unfolding and basic survival. Just as feudalism, being based on an agrarian society, oriented its class structure in relationships to the livelihood-producing land, so do the so-called democracies in the world today. Therefore, the very idea the state government is detached or without the influence of capitalism is a purely abstract theory with no truth in reality. Capitalism essentially molded the governmental apparatus's nature and unfolding, not the other way around. So, when people argue that government regulation of the market is the root of the problem and that the market should be free without structural or legal inhibition, they are confused in their associative understanding. The entire legal system, which is the central tool of government, will always be infiltrated and used to assist in competitive tactics by business to maintain and increase advantage since that is the very nature of the game. To expect anything else is to assume that there are actually moral limits to the act of competition. Yet, this is completely subjective. Such moral and ethical assumptions have no empirical basis, especially when the very nature of the socioeconomic system is oriented around power, exploitation and competition all considered to be, in fact, ideal virtues of the good businessman, as noted before. If a profit-seeking institution can gain power in the government, which is the exact intent of corporate lobbying, and manipulate the governmental apparatus to favor their business or industry to gain advantage, then that is simply good business. It is only when the competitive attacks reach peak levels of unfairness that action is taken to preserve the illusion of balance. We see this with antitrust laws and the like. These laws are, in reality, not to protect free trade or the like, but to settle extreme acts of competitive intent inherent in the marketplace, with all sides jockeying for advantage by whatever means possible. Even the very constituents of all governments in the world today are invariably of the corporate business class. Hence, deep business values are clearly inherent in the mindsets of those in power. Thorstein Veblen wrote of this reality in the early 20th century, the responsible officials and their chief administrative officers so much as may at all reasonably be called the government or the administration are invariably and characteristically drawn from these beneficiary classes, nobles, gentlemen or businessmen, which all come to the same thing for the purpose in hand, the point of it all being that the common man does not come within these precincts and does not share in these councils that are assumed to guide the destiny of the nations. So, to argue that the free market is not free due to intervention is to misunderstand what the nature of free really means with respect to the system. The freedom is not the freedom of everyone to be able to fairly participate in the open market and all the utopian rhetoric we hear about today by apologists of the capitalist system, the real freedom is actually the freedom to dominate, suppress and beat other businesses by whatever competitive means possible. In this, no level playing field is possible. In fact, if the government did not interfere by way of monopoly slash antitrust laws or the bailing out of banks and the like, the entire market complex would have self-destructed a long time ago. In part, this inherent instability of the market is what economists like John Maynard Keynes basically understood, but arguably to a limited extent. Individuality and Freedom all too often people speak of freedom in a way that is more of an indescribable gesture than a tangible circumstance. We hear this rhetoric in the political and economic establishments constantly today where associations of democracy are made to this freedom, both on the level of the traditional practice of voting and the movement of money itself via independent free trade. 
These sociopolitical memes are also reinforced in a polarized way, relatively, which often uses examples of oppression and the loss of freedom and liberty in prior social systems to defend the current state of affairs. The creative works of philosophers, artists and writers who have been influential in furthering various ideological notions of this freedom, often at the expense of societal vulnerability, increasing this dogmatic polarization, has further compounded these values. In short, a great deal of fear and emotional power exists around the notion of social change and how it might affect our lives in the way of liberty and individuality. Yet, if we step back and think about what freedom means away from these cultural memes, we find that notions of freedom can be argued as relative given human history, along with standards of living and even personal expression itself. Therefore, in order to decide what freedom is and how to qualify it, we need to measure it from an a. historical perspective on one side and with respect to b. future possibility on the other. Historically, the fundamental concern is based on the fear of power and the abuse of power. Human history, in part, is certainly one of perpetual power struggles. Fueled by deeply divisive religious and philosophical beliefs and values, which manifested abject slavery, the subjugation of women, periodic genocide, prosecution for heresy, free speech, or what was and still is known as free thought, the divine right of kings and the like, it could be argued that human history in this context is a history of dangerous, unfounded superstitions made sacrosanct by primitive values slash understanding in those periods of time, at the expense of human well-being and social balance. The fear and scarcity of these earlier periods appears to have amplified the worst of what we might consider human nature, often seeking power as a way to avoid the abuse of power in a vicious cycle. Yet, it is critically important to notice that we have been in a process of transition away from these archaic values and beliefs overall, with the global culture and its institutions slowly embracing scientific causality and its merit with respect to what is real and what isn't. With this, certain positive trends have become clear. We have moved from the divine, ultimate power of genetically determined kings and pharaohs into a system of very limited, yet general public participation via a so-called democratic process in most of the world. Human exploitation, subjugation and abject slavery has lost its common defenses of religious, racial or gender superiority and improved to the extent that the slavery today overall takes the less severe form of wage labor in the larger context of class associations as determined by one's place in the economic hierarchy. The market economy, in all its historical forms, has also been able to overcome the race-like caste predeterminations as well since it does allow a level of, limited, social mobility in the community where income gained facilitates more general freedom. Such progressive realities need to be taken into account as capitalism, with all its flaws, has served to help improve certain things in the social condition. Yet, what hasn't changed is the underlying premise that is still elitist and bigoted in how it favors one group over another, both structurally and sociologically. Only in this case, the group favored has nothing much to do with gender, race or religion anymore, but to do with a kind of forceful expedience and competitive mentality that pushes itself to the top of the class hierarchy, at the inevitable expense of others. Capitalism, it could well be argued, is really is a postmodern slavery system, with a new value orientation of competitive freedom holding it in place. This reinvented notion of freedom basically says that we are all free to compete with each other and take what we can. Yet, as noted before, such a state of open freedom, existing without abuse, oppression and structural advantage is clearly impossible. So, while proponents of capitalism may adduce the social improvements which have occurred since its advent as evidence of its social efficacy, we must acknowledge that its root form is not in the interest of human freedom, but an echo of social bigotry which has been polluting culture for thousands of years, rooted in a general psychology of elitism and scarcity. Today, true freedom is directly related to the amount of money a person has. Those below the poverty line have severe limitations on personal freedom as compared to the wealthy. Likewise, while proponents of the free market often talk about coercion in the context of state power, the reality of economic coercion is ignored. Traditional economic theorists constantly use rhetoric that suggests that everything is an issue of choice in the market and if a person wishes to take a job or not, it is their choice. Yet, those in poverty, which is the majority, face a severe reduction of choice. 
the pressures of their limited economic capacity creates a powerful state of coercion by which they not only must take labor roles they might not appreciate to survive, they are often subject to vast exploitation in the form of low wage rates due to that same desperation. In fact, general poverty, in this context, is a very positive condition for the capitalist class for it ensures cost efficiency in the form of cheaper labor. So again, while we may have seen some societal improvement over time, this improvement is really just a variation of a common theme of general elitism, exploitation and bigotry. The long history of assumed resource scarcity and limits on production have also compounded this idea, in the Malthusian sense, where the idea of everyone finding some level of economic equality was deemed simply impossible. Yet, modern science and the exponential development of technical application, along with a deeper awareness of our human condition, has opened the door to future possibilities for social improvement and, in fact, a further elevation of freedom in ways never before seen. This awareness presents a problem since the possibility of achieving this new level is deeply inhibited by the values and establishment set forth by the traditional capitalist social order. In other words, the market system simply cannot facilitate these improvements because the nature of their culmination is against the very mechanisms of the system. For example, the efficiency made possible on the technical, scientific level today, if correctly applied, could provide a high standard of living for every human on earth, coupled with the removing of dangerous and monotonous labor through the application of cybernated mechanization. In the world today, the vast majority of people spend most of their life working in occupation and sleeping. Many of these occupations are not enjoyed and are arguably irrelevant with respect to true personal or social contribution and development. So, if we wish to think about what freedom means on a basic level, it means being able to direct your life in the way you wish, within reason. Being able to live your life without worrying about your basic survival and health, or that of your family, is the first step. Likewise, the labor for income system is one of the most unfree institutions that could exist today not only with respect to the inherent economic coercion, but also with respect to the corporate structure itself, which is quite literally a top-down, hierarchical dictatorship. Sadly, even with these possibilities present and real, the value system disorder built from the capitalist model and its rather paranoid fear of anything outside of it, has and will continue to fight these possibilities for more elevated states of freedom. In fact, the very idea of providing basic social support in the form of welfare or the like is attacked, in part, on the basis of its avoidance of facilitating the open market, the very market that, in reality, likely created the impoverished state of those who need such assistance. As a final note on the subject of freedom, capitalist theory, both historical and modern, is devoid of any relationship to the Earth's resources and its governing ecological laws. Apart from the most primitive awareness of scarcity, which is a marker of the common supply and demand value theory, the scientific nature of the world is absent in this model, it is external. This omission, paired with the exploitation and cost-reducing reality inherent to the incentive system of the market, is what has generated the vast environmental problems, from soil depletion, to pollution, to deforestation, to virtually everything else we can think of on the ecological level. In analyzing the early development of this philosophy, we can logically speculate about how this came to be. Given the largely agrarian base of production and the minimalism of early handicraft-type good production, our capacity at that time to negatively affect the environment was inherently limited. We simply did not pose as much of a threat since the vast edifice of industry as we know it today had not evolved. This development reveals that under the surface of capitalism is an old perspective, which is growing increasingly out of date, with ever-occurring repercussions resulting as our technological capacity increases our ability to affect the world. A parallel would be the institution of war. Competitive values and warfare were a tolerable reality when the damage done was limited to primitive muskets centuries ago. Today, we have nuclear weapons that can destroy everything. So, taking an evolutionary view, capitalism has been a practice and value orientation that did help progress in certain ways, but all trend evidence now shows that the inherent immaturity of the system will lead to ever-increasing problems if it persists. The Marketization of Life As a final point of this essay, the trend of the ever-increasing marketization of life has created a deep distortion of values in the world. Since freedom has been culturally associated with democracy and democracy in the economic sense has been associated with the ability to buy and sell, 
the commodification of just about everything one can think of has been occurring. Traditional values and rhetoric of prior generations have often viewed the use of money in some ways as something of a cold necessity, with some elements of our lives considered sacred and not for sale. The act of prostitution, for example, in which people sell intimacy for money, is a situation where cultural values usually find alienation. In most countries the act is illegal, even though there is little legal justification since sexual engagement itself is legal. It is only when the element of purchase comes into play, is it deemed reprehensible. However, such sanctities that have been culturally perpetuated are becoming increasingly overturned by the market mindset. Today, whether legal or not, nearly anything can be bought or sold. You can buy the right to bypass carbon emissions regulations, you can upgrade your prison cell for a fee, buy the right to hunt endangered animals, and even buy your way into a prestigious university without meeting testing requirements. It becomes a strange state when some of the most normal, natural acts of human life become incentivized by money as well, such as how it is being used to encourage children to read or encourage weight loss. Psychologically, what does it mean for a child when they are reinforced with money for their most basic actions? How will this affect their future sense of reward? These are important questions in a world for sale, with the guiding value principle that it is only when one makes money from an action, is that action worth doing? Such market values appear as a clear social distortion as the very essence of human initiative and existence is being transformed. While we might not take much extreme concern over seemingly trivial issues such as the fact one can purchase access to the carpool lane while driving solo, the larger manifestation of a culture built on the edifice of everything being for sale, is the dehumanization of society as everyone and everything is reduced to a mere commodity for exploit. Today, as shocking as it is, there are actually more slaves in the world than any time in human history. Human trafficking has and continues to be a massive industry for profit, selling men, women and children into various roles. The U.S. Department of State has published it is estimated that as many as 27 million men, women, and children around the world are victims of what is now often described with the umbrella term human trafficking. The work that remains in combating this crime is the work of fulfilling the promise of freedom, freedom from slavery for those exploited and the freedom for survivors to carry on with their lives. In the end, while most people who believe in the free market capitalist system would ethically stand in outrage at these vast human abuses occurring in the world, usually making distinctions between moral and immoral forms of trade, the fact of the matter is that the commodification concept itself can draw no objective lines and such extreme realities are, in truth, simply a matter of degree with respect to application. From a purely philosophical standpoint, there is no technical difference between any form of market exploitation. The psychology inherent, the value system disorder, has and will continue to perpetuate a predatory disregard within the culture and it is only when that structural mechanism is removed from our very approach to societal organization, will the aforementioned issues find resolution. Structural Classism, The State and War Man is the only patriot. He sets himself apart in his own country, under his own flag, and sneers at the other nations and keeps multitudinous uniformed assassins on hand at heavy expense to grab slices of other people's countries, and keep them from grabbing slices of his. And in the intervals between campaigns he washes the blood of his hands and works for the universal brotherhood of man with his mouth. Mark Twain Overview Human conflict has been a consistent characteristic of society since the beginning of recorded history. While justifications of this have ranged from assumptions of immutable human propensities towards aggression and territoriality, to the religious notion of polarized metaphysical powers at work, such as forces of good and evil, history has revealed that cases of conflict generally have a rational correlation to environmental circumstances and or cultural conditions. From the immediate, fearful stress reaction of our fight-or-flight propensity, to the calm, calculated planning of strategic national warfare, there is always a reason for such conflict and the general public's interest to reduce conflict naturally requires we fully assess causality as deeply as we can to consider tangible solutions. This essay will examine two general categories of warfare, imperial warfare and class warfare.
while perhaps seemingly different, it will be argued that the root psychological mechanisms of these two categorizations are basically the same, along with how some of the actual mechanisms of battle are actually much more elusive or covert than many recognize. Overall, the central thesis is that the source of these seemingly immutable realities resides within the socioeconomic premise itself in the context of a certain reinforced psychology and hence sociological schemata, not rigid determinations in our genes or lack of some moral aptitude. Put another way, these present realities are not fueled by ideologically isolated groups such as, for example, a rogue country's government or some exceptionally greedy business mentality, but rather by the most fundamental, underlying values inherent to virtually everyone's lives in the current socioeconomic condition we perpetuate as culturally normal. The only difference is the degree to which these values are harnessed and for what purpose. Imperial War, Rise of the State the Neolithic Revolution, some 12,000 years ago, marked a pivotal turning point for human society as it transitioned us from almost exclusively living off the land limited to the habitat's natural regeneration, to an accelerating trend of environmental control and resource manipulation. The development of agriculture and the creation of labor-easing tools was the beginning of what can be observed today, where the spectrum of the human capacity to utilize science for the alteration of the world for our advantage appears virtually unlimited. However, this initially slow technological adaptation has set in motion certain patterns and changes, which have arguably generated many of the problems we recognize as all too common today. An example would be how imbalance through relative poverty and economic stratification has taken hold as an apparent consequence of this new capacity. In the words of neuroscientist and anthropologist Dr. Robert Sapolsky, hunter-gatherers had thousands of wild sources of food to subsist on. Agriculture changed all that, generating an overwhelming reliance on a few dozen food sources. Agriculture allowed for the stockpiling of surplus resources and thus, inevitably, the unequal stockpiling of them, stratification of society and the invention of classes. Thus it has allowed for the invention of poverty. Likewise, the rather nomadic lifestyle of the hunter-gatherer slowly became replaced with settled, protectionist tribes and then eventually localized city-type societies. In the words of Richard A. Gabriel in the work A Short History of War, the invention and spread of agriculture, coupled with the domestication of animals in the 5th millennium BC, are acknowledged as the developments that set the stage for the emergence of the first large-scale, complex urban societies. These societies, which appeared almost simultaneously around 4000 BC in both Egypt and Mesopotamia, used stone tools, but within 500 years stone tools and weapons gave way to bronze. With bronze manufacture came a revolution in warfare. This is also the period that the concept of the state as we know it and the permanence of the armed force emerged. Gabriel continues, these early societies produced the first examples of state-governing institutions, initially as centralized chiefdoms and later as monarchies, at the same time, centralization demanded the creation of an administrative structure capable of directing social activity and resources toward communal goals. The development of central state institutions and a supporting administrative apparatus inevitably gave form and stability to military structures. The result was the expansion and stabilization of the formerly loose and unstable warrior castes, by 2700 BC. In Sumer there was a fully articulated military structure and standing army organized along modern lines. The standing army emerged as a permanent part of the social structure and was endowed with strong claims to social legitimacy and it has been with us ever since. Imperial War, Illusions Imperialism is defined as, the policy, practice, or advocacy of extending the power and dominion of a nation especially by direct territorial acquisitions or by gaining indirect control over the political or economic life of other areas. While traditional culture might generally think of imperial war as a variation of war in general, assuming other forms of armed, national conflict, it is argued here that the root basis of all national wars are actually imperial in nature. The literally thousands of wars in recorded human history have had to do mostly with the acquisition of resources or territory, where one group is either working to expand its power and material wealth, or working to protect itself from others trying to conquer and absorb their power and wealth. Even many historical conflicts, which on the surface appear to be for the purposes of pure ideology, are often actually hidden imperial economic moves. 
The Christian Crusades of the 11th century, for example, are often defined as strictly religious conflicts or expressions of ideological fervor. Yet, a deeper investigation reveals a powerful undertone of trade expansion and resource acquisition, under the guise of the religious war. This is not to say that religions have not been a source of tremendous conflict historically, but to show that there is often an oversimplification found in many historical texts, with the economic relevance often missed or ignored. Regardless, the notion of the moral crusade as a form of cover for national, economic imperialism continues to this day. In fact, there is a deeply coercive tendency witnessed throughout history when it comes to gaining public support for the act of national warfare. For instance, a cursory review of history will find that all offensive acts of war, meaning war initiated by a given power for whatever reason, not a response to direct invasion, originate from the constituents and associates of the governmental body, not the citizenry. Wars tend to begin with some kind of announced suggestion emanating from state power, then fueled by the corporate state-supported media, with the citizenry slowly groomed to appreciate the suggestion. It also helps the state a great deal if there is some form of emotionally striking provocation as well, which can be manipulated to further justify the intended war. Such tactics for the manipulation of a citizenry can take many forms. The use of fear, honor, revenge, patriotic paternalism, morality, and the common defense are likely the most common ploys. In fact, invariably all acts of war are justified as defensive in the public sphere, even if there is no rational, tangible public threat to be found. Yet, there is, indeed, a core truth to this notion of defensive war, since acts of imperial mobilization are based on a very real, yet obscure form of economic and or political fear, the fear of losing control or power. In other words, while there may not be a direct, immediate threat to a given, aggressor nation, the long-term competitive need to continually re-secure its existing power from possible future loss is a very real and founded fear. So, in effect, this defense is that of elitist, upper-class self-preservation and hence usually morally unjustifiable to the public in its true terms, hence these ploys are used instead to gain public approval. Economist and sociologist Thorstein Veblen, in his famous 1917 work An Inquiry into the Nature of Peace and the Terms of Its Perpetuation wrote the following on the subject of public persuasion, any warlike enterprise that is hopeful to be entered on must have the moral sanction of the community or of an effective majority in the community. It consequently becomes the first concern of the warlike statesman to put this moral force and train for the adventure on which he is bent. And there are two main lines of motivation, the preservation or furtherance of the community's material interest, real or fancied and vindication of the national honor. To these should perhaps be added a third, the advancement and perpetuation of the nation's culture. This last point on the perpetuation of the nation's culture is best exemplified with the common, modern Western imperial claims of seeking to spread freedom and democracy. This claim takes a paternal position, positing the idea that the current political climate of a targeted nation is simply too inhumane and intervention to help its citizens becomes a moral obligation of the invading power. Veblen continues, any patriotism will serve as ways and means to warlike enterprise under competent management, even if, the people are, not habitually prone to a bellicose temper. Rightly managed, ordinary patriotic sentiment may readily be mobilized for warlike adventure by any reasonably adroit and single-minded body of statesmen of which there is abundant illustration. It is, also, quite a safe generalization that when hostilities have once been got fairly underway by the interested statesmen, the patriotic sentiment of the nation may confidently be counted on to back the enterprise, irrespective of the merits of the quarrel. In America, the phrase I'm against the war but support the troops is common among those who oppose a given conflict but wish to be viewed as still respectful of their country in general. This phrase is unique as it is actually irrational. To logically support the troops would mean to support the role of being a troop, hence the acts that are required by that role. The implicit gesture, of course, is that one supports the need for war and hence supports the men and women of the armed forces who assist that need. Yet, the statement itself is fully contradictory and exists as a form of doublethink, as to disagree with the existence of a certain war is to wholly disagree with actions of those who engage it. It is similar to saying, I'm against cancer killing people, but I support cancer's right to life. 
The armed forces have historically been held in high public esteem by a citizenry and the government continually glorifies this to the extent that the assumption of honor takes on an irrational life of its own. In fact, it is compounded psychologically by a built-in ceremonialism. Honor is formalized through awards, medals, parades, postures of respect and other adornments which impress the public as to the supposed value of the actions of the soldiers and hence the institution of war. This further reinforces the cultural taboo where to insult any element of the war apparatus is seen as showing disrespect for the sacrifice of the armed forces. From the standpoint of true protection and problem resolution, as would be the honorable case of a firefighter who saves a child from a burning building, this admiration is warranted. The selfless, altruistic position of putting one's life at risk for the benefit of another is naturally a noble act. However, in the context of historical warfare, the personal altruism of a soldier does not justify broad acts of national, imperial aggression, no matter how well-intentioned the soldiers may be. Furthermore, this fear-oriented power preservation by the established governmental apparatus also naturally generates a subwar against the domestic citizenry itself, almost always amplified in times of war. Those who challenge or oppose a given national conflict have historically been met with direct oppression and, by cultural extension, public resentment. The common yet ambiguous legal violations of treason and sedition are historical examples of this, along with the pattern of suspending the rights of citizens during times of war, sometimes even including free speech. Socially, the use of patriotism, as noted before, is also very common to the effect that those who do not support a war are often dismissed as not supporting the national citizenry by extension, creating alienation. More recently, those in opposition and perhaps engaging in protest actions have been considered terrorists by the state, a powerful incrimination with severe legal consequences if deemed true by the authorities. However, this subwar can be deconstructed into an even deeper mechanism, what could be called a kind of social control in support of imperial intent. In many countries today, either by obligation from birth or by persuasion to legally binding contracts the pressure or motivation to join the military itself is manipulative on many levels. Advertising tactics such as money for college or personal accomplishment are common, arguably targeting the lower rungs of the economic hierarchy. The United States is on record for having at times spent billions a year, $4.7 billion in 2009, on global public relations and assist public image and recruitment. Imperial War, Source When the traditional, propagandized illusions in defense of the act of organized human murder and resource theft have been overridden, dismissing such shallow justifications as paternal patriotism, honor and protectionism, we find that war today is actually an inherent characteristic of the propertied, scarcity-driven business system. It would be false to say that war is a product of capitalism in and of itself since the practice of war predates capitalism extensively. However, when we deconstruct the premise itself we see that war is, indeed, a central, immutable feature of capitalism as it is simply a more sophisticated manifestation of these same, divisive, competitive, archaic values and practices. Just as a corporation competes with other corporations of the same genre for income survival, invariably seeking monopoly and cartel when it can, all governments on the planet are fundamentally premised on the same form of survival by extension. Using America as a case study, in 2011, the country gained about $2.3 trillion in federal income tax revenues alone. These revenues are important to the operation of what is, in effect, the business institution known as America, in the same way the annual earnings of Microsoft affect its ability to function. America is, in truth, a corporation in function and form, with all the registered businesses existing in its domestic legal web to be considered subsidiaries of this parent institution we traditionally call the U.S. government. Therefore, all actions of the U.S. government, along with all competing governments in the world, must naturally keep an acute business acumen in operation. However, what separates this parent corporation, America, from its subsidiary sectors, corporations, is the scale of its capacity to preserve itself and keep a competitive edge. Its necessity to preserve the core drivers of its economy is crucial and a cursory glance at history regarding how the U.S. was able to gain and maintain its status of a global empire shows this business acumen clearly. The manifestation is really little different in principle than how a specific corporation seeks to gain a commercial monopoly. 
Only in this case the ideal of global monopoly, empire, is not restricted by legal mandate as is commonly claimed by the domestic legal restraint it is forcefully executed in the theater of imperial war. In fact, interestingly enough, but not unexpectedly, the very act of this self-preservation through military might have itself become a powerfully lucrative business venture which often improves the economic state of the nation and hence profits to its corporate constituents. Today, we can extend these economic benefits to the mass of military expenditures along with the reconstruction of war-torn areas by the conquering state's commercial subsidiaries, the slow prodding of a country's integrity through trade tariffs, sanctions and debt impositions for the sake of population subjugation for the benefit of transcontinental industries and many other modern economic war conventions. This point was likely best expressed by one of America's most decorated army officers of the 20th century, Major General Smedley D. Butler. Butler was the author of a famous book released after World War I titled War is a Racket, and stated the following with respect to the business of war, war is a racket. It always has been. It is possibly the oldest, easily the most profitable, surely the most vicious. It is the only one international in scope. It is the only one in which the profits are reckoned in dollars and the losses in lives. He also wrote in 1935, I spent 33 years and four months in active military service and during that period I spent most of my time as a high-class muscleman for big business, for Wall Street and the bankers. In short, I was a racketeer, a gangster for capitalism. I helped make Mexico and especially Tampico safe for American oil interests in 1914. He also wrote in 1935, I spent 33 years and four months in active military service and during that period I spent most of my time as a high-class muscleman for big business, for Wall Street and the bankers. In short, I was a racketeer, a gangster for capitalism. I helped make Mexico and especially Tampico safe for American oil interests in 1914. I helped make Haiti and Cuba a decent place for the National City Bank boys to collect revenues in. I helped in the raping of half a dozen Central American republics, for the benefit of Wall Street. I helped purify Nicaragua for the International Banking House of Brown Brothers in 1902-1912. I brought light to the Dominican Republic for the American sugar interests in 1916. I helped make Honduras right for the American fruit companies in 1903. In China in 1927 I helped see to it that Standard Oil went on its way unmolested. Looking back on it, I might have given Al Capone a few hints. The best he could do was to operate his racket in three districts. I operated on three continents. John A. Hobson's, 1858-1940, Monumental Work Imperialism, a study described the tendency as a social parasitic process by which a moneyed interest within the state, usurping the reins of government, makes for imperial expansion in order to fasten economic suckers into foreign bodies so as to drain them of their wealth in order to support domestic luxury. Now, many would think about these acts of abuse as a form of corruption, but this reasoning is difficult to justify in the broad view. The ethical and moral argument of fair and unfair has no cogent integrity within the system framework inherent to capitalism. This is one of the unfortunate failures of realization by those who are active in the message of world peace or anti-war activism, but yet still defend the competitive market model. In other words, world peace appears simply not a possibility within the currently accepted model of economic practice. Every step of the application of global capitalism, starting from its European inception, has been associated with vast violence, exploitation and subjugation. European colonialism, the capture of African slaves for use and sale, the forced subjugation of countless colonial peoples, and the creation of privileged sanctuaries of profiteering and power for the many government-created or government-protected businesses, only touches the surface of its inherent character as a war system of thought. Thorstein Veblen, again writing from 1917, makes the direct connection to what he called the pecuniary or monetary foundation of war. It has appeared in the course of the argument that the preservation of the present pecuniary law and order, with all its incident of ownership and investment, is incompatible with an unwarlike state of peace and security. 
This current scheme of investment, business, and industrial sabotage should have an appreciably better chance of survival in the long run if the present conditions of warlike preparation and national insecurity were maintained, or if the projected peace were left in a somewhat problematic state, sufficiently precarious to keep national animosities alert. So, if the projectors of this peace at large are in any degree inclined to seek concessive terms on what the peace might hopefully be made enduring, it should evidently be part of their endeavors from the outset to put events in train for the present abatement and eventual abrogation of the rights of ownership and of the price system in which these rights take effect. Further evidence of this context can be found in the more modern forms of indirect violence. These include economic warfare approaches, as mentioned before, which can serve as complete acts of aggression in and of themselves, or as a part of a procedural prelude to traditional military action. Examples come in the form of trade tariffs, sanctions, debt by coercion, and many other lesser-known, covert methods to weaken a country. Global financial institutions such as the World Bank and IMF have heavy vested state and hence business interests behind them and they have the power to allocate debt to bail out suffering countries at the expense of the quality of life of its citizenry, often taking charge of natural resources or industries through select privatization or other manners, which can weaken a country's ability to the effect that it becomes reliant on others, to the advantage of commercial outsiders. This is simply a more covert manner of subjugation than was seen, say, with the British Empire's imperial expansion through its East India Company, the commercial force that took advantage of the newly conquered regional resources and labor in Asia in the 17th century. However, unlike British Empire expansion, American Empire expansion did not gain its status through military action alone, even though such a presence is still enormous globally. Rather, the use of complex economic strategies that repositioned other countries into subjugation to U.S. economic and geoeconomic interests was made common. Class War, Inherent Psychology Moving on to the class war this notion has been noted in historical literature for centuries based partly on assumptions of human nature, partly on assumptions of a lack of capacity of the earth and production means to meet everyone's needs and partly on the more relevant awareness that the system of market capitalism inevitably guarantees class division and imbalance due to its inherent mechanisms, both structurally and psychologically. Founding free market economist David Ricardo's statement that if wages should rise, then, profits would necessarily fall is a simple acknowledgement of the structural assurance of class conflict as the wage relates to the lower working class and the profits the upper capitalist class and as one gains, the other loses. Likewise, even Adam Smith in his canonical The Wealth of Nations clearly expresses the nature of power preservation on the behavioral, psychological, level, stating, civil government, so far as it is instituted for the security of property, is in reality instituted for the defense of the rich against the poor, or of those who have some property against those who have none at all. However, the true use of government for the purposes of the upper or business class seems to be stubbornly ignored by Smith, Ricardo and even many of today's economists, who seem unable or unwilling to take into account present-day events. Even the most committed, laissez-faire market economist still expresses the need for government and its legal apparatus to exist as something of a referee to keep the game fair. Terms such as crony capitalism are often used under the assumption that collusion between a governmental constituency and the seemingly detached corporate institutions is of an unethical or criminal nature. Yet again, as noted before, it is illogical to assume that the nature of government is anything else at its core than a vehicle to support the businesses that comprise the wealth of that country. The business apparatus really is the country in technical form, regardless of the surface claim that a democratic country is organized around the interests of the citizenry itself. In fact, it can be well argued that no government in recorded history has ever offered its citizens a legitimate place in governance or legislation and within the context of modern capitalism, which is still a manifestation of centuries-old values and assumptions with a clear elitism and intent, it is interesting how this myth of democracy perpetuates itself today in the way that it does. To further this point, one of the architects of the U.S. Constitution of the United States, James Madison, expressed his concern very clearly regarding the need to oppress the political power of those in the lower classes. He stated, in England, at this day, if elections were open to all classes of people, the property of landed proprietors would be insecure. An agrarian law would soon take place. If these observations be just, our government ought to secure the permanent interests of the country against innovation. 
landholders ought to have a share in the government to support these invaluable interests and to balance and check the other. They ought to be so constituted as to protect the minority of the opulent against the majority. The Senate, therefore, ought to be this body, and to answer these purposes, they ought to have permanency and stability. So, starting with this awareness that the very premise of global democracy is deeply inhibited by the capitalist incentive system to competitively maintain power on the level of the state to assist the upper class in preserving political and, by extension, financial power, a clearer picture of how deep this class war runs is obtained. Likely the most striking aspect of this is how such mechanisms of class division exist in our everyday lives but yet go unseen since they are structurally built into the financial, political and legal apparatus itself. Class War, Structural Mechanisms In the modern day, with 40% of the planet's wealth being owned by 1% of the world's population, we find that both in terms of system structure and incentive psychology, powerful mechanisms exist to maintain and even accelerate this grossly disproportionate global wealth imbalance. Needless to say, given the financial basis of everything in the world today, with great wealth comes great power. Hence, as described prior, this power enables a more robust strategy for competitive gain and self-preservation and consequently it has hence extended into the very structure of the social system itself, assuring that the upper class has great ease in maintaining their vast wealth security, while the lower classes face enormous structural barriers to attaining any basic level of financial security. Some mechanisms of this class war oppression are fairly obvious. For instance, the debate over taxation, and how there has been an historical favoring of the corporate rich over the working poor, is one example. The argument of the establishment usually revolves around the idea that since the rich are also the ownership class and are partly responsible for the generation of general employment, they should be given more financial freedom. As an aside, it is easy to see that there is very little true merit in this one-sided argument since the financial oppression through public taxation is actually limiting the purchasing power of the general public, creating an arguably more powerful impediment to economic growth than the mere limiting of the coffers of the corporate employers. The only exception to this, which transcends the argument of the rich as job creators, is the advent of platonomy, which will be addressed towards the end of this essay. Class favoring taxation aside, for other more critical structural factors will be discussed, a. debt, b. interest, c. inflation, and d. income disparity. Debt is a misunderstood social practice in that most assume debt is an option in society today. In reality, the entire financial system is built out of debt, quite literally. All money is brought into existence through loans in the modern economy, coming from central and commercial banks who essentially create the money out of the demand itself. This basic mechanism of monetary creation is a powerful force of economic oppression. Household debt today tends to consist of credit card loans, housing loans, car loans and student, educational, loans. Those in the lower classes naturally hold higher levels of this consumer debt than the upper class since the very nature of being unable to pay outright for basic social staples, such as a car or a home, forces the need for banks' loans. The result is that the pressure of debt is constant in the lives of the vast majority. The general wage and income rates being what they are on average, naturally as low as possible to assist with the dominant capitalist ethos of cost efficiency upon which the entire society is engineered, the wage income made by the average employee tends to only barely meet the basic loan servicing requirements while in concert with meeting basic, everyday survival needs. Hence a form of running in place is constant and the possibility of social mobility up the class hierarchy is deeply impeded, let alone the difficulty of simply getting out of debt itself. Interest, coupled with debt is the profit attribute associated the sale of money itself. Since the capitalist market economy supports the general commodification of virtually everything, it is no surprise that money itself is sold into existence for profit and this comes in the form of interest. Whether it is a central bank creating money in exchange for government securities or a commercial bank making a mortgage loan to an average person, interest fees are almost always attached. As mentioned in previous essays, this creates the condition where more debt is generated than actual money in circulation to cover it. When a loan is made, only what is termed the principal is produced. The money supply of any country consists of this principal in form, which is the aggregate value of all loans made, money creation. The interest fee, on the other hand, is not in existence. 
This means that, on the social level, all those taking interest-bearing loans must find money from the pre-existing money supply in order to cover it when paying the loan back. In this process, since all interest paid is being pulled from the principal, it is a mathematical eventuality that certain loans simply cannot be repaid. There simply isn't enough money in the system at any one time. The result is an even more powerful downward class pressure on those holding such basic, common loans since there is always this basic scarcity in the money supply itself and everyone working to service their loans have to contend with the inevitable reality that someone is going to fail to meet their loan repayment in the long run. Bankruptcy is a common result in those segments of society that get this short end of the stick. Even more troubling is how the banking mechanism reacts to those who are unable to fulfill their loan obligation. The loan contract and legal system support the power of banks, in most cases, to repossess the physical property of those who cannot pay. If we think deeply about this ability to repossess, it is arguably an indirect form of theft. If it is inevitable that some will succumb to not meeting their loan repayment due to the inherent scarcity in the money supply, with the possible result of the physical property obtained from that loaned money being repossessed by the bank via contractual agreements, then the bank's acquisition of such true, physical property is inevitable over time. This means the banks, which are always owned by members of the upper class to be sure, are taking houses, cars and property of the lower classes, simply because the money they created out of thin air in the form of a loan is not being returned to them. This is, in essence, a covert form of physical wealth transfer from the lower to the upper class. However, returning to the subject of interest itself, such realities are of little direct concern to the upper class. Given the wealth surplus inherent to their financial status, coupled with the lack of necessity to even take loans most of the time due to this surplus, the scarcity pressure inherent to the money supply due to interest fees always falls on the shoulders of the lower classes. Also, the wealthy are actually further class protected as the phenomenon of investment income via interest earned from large savings accounts, certificates of deposit and other means, turns this vehicle of social oppression for the poor into a vehicle of financial advantage for the rich. Inflation is generally defined as the rate at which the general level of prices for goods and services is rising, and, subsequently, purchasing power is falling. Unfortunately, this common definition gives no insight into its true causality. While there has been debate as to the true causes of inflation in different economic schools, the quantity theory of money has been proven as the most relevant. In short, this theory simply recognizes that the more money in circulation, the more inflation or rising prices. In other words, all things being equal, if we double the money supply, price levels will also double, etc. The new money dilutes the value of the existing money in a variation of the supply-demand theory of value. The consequence of this is what we could call a hidden tax on people's savings and fixed income rates. For example, let us assume the inflation rate is 3.5% a year. If you have $30,000, in 10 years it will only buy about $21,000 worth of goods. While this might appear to have an equal effect for the whole of society, the reality is that it deeply affects the poor much more than the rich when it comes to survival. A person with $3 million in savings is not much hindered by the 3.5% loss of purchasing power. However, a person with only $30,000 in savings, working to perhaps put a down payment on a home in the future, is deeply affected by this hidden tax. In the context of structural classism, where fixed attributes of the system itself assist in the oppression of the poor and helping of the rich, the mechanism of this hidden tax is also immutably built in. The inherent scarcity in the money supply forces new loans, constantly in the economy. Coupled with that is the now globally utilized monetary expansion process known as the fractional reserve lending system. Contrary to popular belief, most loans are not given from a bank's existing deposits. They are invented in real time, limited only by a set percentage of their existing deposits. In short, due to this process over time, it is currently possible that for every $10,000 deposited, about $90,000 can be created from it through the process of ongoing loans and deposits across the entire banking system. This pyramiding of money, coupled with the interest pressure that creates scarcity in the money supply, reveals that the system is inherently inflationary. Income differences across society also have both a psychological and structural causality. Psychologically, they are driven, in part, 
by the basic profit and cost preservation incentive necessary to remain competitive and functional in the market. In many ways this incentive could be considered cognitively structural, as there is a behavioral threshold that all players in the market economy must adhere when it comes to survival. In turn, this interest of self-preservation though cost efficiency and maximizing profits, while basic to the capitalist game at its core, shows a clear tendency to extend as an overall survival philosophy or human value system in general. In other words, social values become altered by this economic need for constant self-preservation and very often it manifests itself into behavior which, in abstraction, might be condemned as excessive, selfish or greedy when, in fact, such deemed characteristics are mere extensions or matters of degree with respect to this basic conditioning to stay ahead. Therefore, the overall trend of increasing income inequality in general should not be a surprise. While the United States, with its deeply competitive nature, is a highlight of extreme class inequality today, the trend is still very much a global phenomenon. While the debate about historical trends versus current trends can be made regarding why this period of time, the early 21st century, is showing such extensive increases in the wealth gap, we might conclude that certain structural factors have made their way into the system and these factors are assisting the disparity. We may also conclude that these mechanisms are not anomalies of the system, but rather represent a natural evolution of capitalism through time. For example, the vast income now coming from capital gains is a case in point. While seemingly a minor nuance of general income, some economic analysts have deemed capital gains to be the key ingredient of income disparity in the U.S. Capital gains are defined as the amount by which an asset selling price exceeds its initial purchase price. A realized capital gain is an investment that has been sold at a profit. Its most common context is with respect to the selling of stocks, bonds, derivatives, futures and other abstract trading vehicles. It has been found that in the United States alone, the top 0.1% of the population earns about half of all capital gains, and such gains account for about 60% of the income of the top 400 richest citizens. The class mechanism of capital gains is interesting because it is a privileged form of income. While the stock market might be used for conservative mutual fund and retirement investment by the general public, it is really an upper-class person's game when it comes to substantial returns due to the high level of capital initially needed to facilitate such high-value returns. Like the elitism of high-level interest income, capital gains are a class-securing mechanism fueled by pre-existing substantial wealth. Then we have the differences in income with respect to one's position in the corporate hierarchy. In a study performed by the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, it was found that Canada's top CEOs make an average worker's yearly salary in three hours. In the United States, according to research by the Economic Policy Institute, the average annual earnings of the top 1% of wage earners grew 156% from 1979 to 2007, for the top 0.1% they grew 362%. In contrast, earners in the 90th to 95th percentiles had wage growth of 34%, less than a tenth as much as those in the top 0.1% tier. Workers in the bottom 90% had the weakest wage growth, at 17% from 1979 to 2007. They continue, the large increase in wage inequality is one of the main drivers of the large upward distribution of household income to the top 1%, the others being the rising inequality of capital income and the growing share of income going to capital rather than wages and compensation. The result of these three trends was a more than doubling of the share of total income in the United States received by the top 1% between 1979 and 2007 and a large increase in the income gap between those at the top and the vast majority. In 2007, average annual incomes of the top 1% of households were 42 times greater than incomes of the bottom 90%, up from 14 times greater in 1979, and incomes of the top 0.1% were 220 times greater, up from 47 times greater in 1979. Similar patterns can be found in other industrialized nations. In fact, in 2013 even China has been discussing their growing income gap problem with proposals to ease the disparity. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development in a 2011 report found that countries with historically low levels of income inequality have experienced significant increases over the past decade. 
Causality in the form of clearly defined structural mechanisms are more difficult to pin down with respect to this general trend of employment-related income imbalance. The combination of the psychological incentive of self-preservation and self-maximization inherent to the value system of capitalism, coupled with the ever-changing legal, tax and financial policy-related variables in play, along with the basic strategic edge maintained by the upper classes due to their existing wealth security, creates a complex, synergistic mechanism of class preservation and external oppression. A subtle yet revealing statistical point to also note is how during recent recessions in the United States, the wealth gap has actually widened. It is axiomatic to conclude that if the system of economy was without structural interference in favor of the wealthy, a national recession on the scale of the what occurred from 2007 onward should have affected most everyone negatively, regardless of social class. Yet, it was reported in 2010 that the wealthiest 5% of Americans, who earn more than $180,000, added slightly to their annual incomes last year, families at the $50,000 median level slipped lower. As a final point on the issue of income inequality, it is important to note how national economic growth often relates to those of the upper class itself, reducing the general economic relevance of the lower classes. The term platonomy is appropriate in this case. A platonomy is defined as economic growth that is powered and consumed by the wealthiest upper class of society. Platonomy refers to a society where the majority of the wealth is controlled by an ever-shrinking minority, as such, the economic growth of that society becomes dependent on the fortunes of that same wealthy minority. Perhaps the best way to describe the nature of platonomy and its relevance to the modern day, is to consider the words of those who embrace it. In 2005, Citigroup, a powerful global banking institution, produced a series of internal memos on the subject and it was quite candid in its analysis and conclusions. They stated, the world is dividing into two blocks, the platonomy and the rest. The US, UK, and Canada are the key platonomies economies powered by the wealthy. In a platonomy, there is no such animal as the US consumer, or the UK consumer, or indeed the Russian consumer. There are rich consumers, few in number, but disproportionate in the gigantic slice of income and consumption they take. There are the rest, the non-rich, the multitudinous many, but only accounting for surprisingly small bites of the national pie. We should worry less about what the average consumer, say the 50th percentile, is going to do, when that consumer is, we think, less relevant to the aggregate data than how the wealthy feel and what they are doing. This is simply a case of mathematics, not morality. With 20% of the American population controlling 85% of the country's wealth, it is clear that those utilizing that 85% are more important to the GDP or growth of the economy. What this means is that the financial system has little incentive to care about the actions or financial well-being of most of the public. It continues, the heart of our platonomy thesis is that the rich are the dominant source of income, wealth and demand in platonomy countries such as the UK, US, Canada and Australia. Secondly, we believe that the rich are going to keep getting richer in coming years, as capitalists, the rich, get an even bigger share of GDP as a result, principally, of globalization. We expect the global pool of labor in developing economies to keep wage inflation in check and profit margins rising, good for the wealth of capitalists, relatively bad for developed market unskilled slash outsourceable labor. This bodes well for companies selling to or servicing the rich. With respect to the relevance of the rest of the population, the memo states, we see the biggest threat to platonomy as coming from a rise in political demands to reduce income inequality, spread the wealth more evenly, and challenge forces such as globalization which have benefited profit and wealth growth. Our conclusion? The three levers governments and societies could pull on to end platonomy are benign. Property rights are generally still intact, taxation policies neutral to favorable and globalization is keeping the supply of labor in surplus, acting as a break on wage inflation. While platonomy itself might not exactly be a source of class conflict, it is certainly a result. Christian Freeland, author of Plutocrats, The Rise of the New Global Super-Rich and the Fall of Everyone Else makes a point about the nature of this framed psychology inherent to those of the opulent minority, you don't do this in a kind of chortling, smoking your cigar, conspiratorial thinking way. You do it by persuading yourself that what is in your own personal self-interest is in the interests of everybody else. 
so you persuade yourself that, actually, government services, things like spending on education, which is what created that social mobility in the first place, need to be cut so that the deficit will shrink, so that your tax bill doesn't go up. And what I really worry about is, there is so much money and so much power at the very top, and the gap between those people at the very top and everybody else is so great, that we are going to see social mobility choked off and society transformed. In conclusion, a great deal more could be said with respect to the multi-level battling occurring on the planet Earth, mostly centric to financial and market power and its institutional preservation. From physical violence to subtle legal manipulation, the theme is consistent and dominant. It could even be argued that progress itself has war waged against it since established corporate institutions who maintain powerful market share in a given industry, will often work to ruthlessly shut down anything that can compete with them, even if the product is progressively better or more sustainable in utility. Change and progress itself, in real terms, are not readily welcomed in the capitalist system as it often disturbs the success of established institutions. The incredibly slow rate of application of new, sustainability, improving technological methods is a case in point. In fact, on the corporate level, there is not only a perpetual war to reduce such competition, but there is also the ongoing exploitation of the public in general. Adam Smith actually made this point in his The Wealth of Nations, stating, the interest of the dealers, however, in any particular branch of trade or manufacturers, is always in some respects different from, and even opposite to, that of the public, to narrow the competition is always the interest of dealers, but to narrow the competition, can serve only to enable the dealers, by raising their profits above what they naturally would be, to levy, for their own benefit, an absurd tax upon the rest of their fellow citizens. On the national level, peace today seems to be merely a pause between conflicts on the stage of global civilization. There is a war going on somewhere virtually all the time and when there isn't, the major powers are busy building more advanced weapons and are selling off the old ones to other countries who are posturing in the same way, all under the name of not only protection but in the name of good business as well. Even nations themselves have taken on a form of class hierarchy with dominant first-world nations subjugating poor third-world nations. Common gradient terms such as superpowers, powers, subpowers and vassal states can be found in historical literature with respect to the national class hierarchy and the structural mechanisms which keep this gradient in form are not very different in intent than what keeps the social classes in order. For example, while the debt and interest systems, as described, do very well to keep downward pressure on the lower classes, structurally limiting prosperity and social mobility, the same effect occurs to repress a nation via the World Bank and International Monetary Fund. Even John Adams, the second president of the United States, pointed this out with his statement, there are two ways to conquer and enslave a country. One is by the sword. The other is by debt. On the broadest scale, the real war being waged is on problem resolution and human harmony. The real war is on a balance of power and social justice. The real war, in effect, is on the institution of economic equality. In the words of former Supreme Court Justice, Louis D. Brandeis, we can have democracy in this country, or we can have great wealth concentrated in the hands of a few, but we can't have both. All across the world today people talk about the need for equality. Most literate people in the world have no respect for gender or racial bias. The idea of being sexist or racist has become a deeply abhorred view, even though it was not that long ago in the Western world such cultural views were considered normal. There appears to be a course of evolution that wishes to equalize society that is, by definition, what the underlying gesture of democracy is supposed to denote. Yet, in the midst of all this, the most oppressive form of segregated human suffering continues largely unnoticed in its true context. Today, it is not race, gender or creed that keeps one most oppressed, it is the institution of class. It is now an issue of rich and poor and, like racism, these ideological and ultimately structural forms of oppression discriminate and divide the human species in deeply powerful and destructive ways. In the broad view, this multidimensional warfare, truly a world at war with itself, is wholly unsustainable. It is becoming more obvious, given the accelerating social problems at hand, that the ethos of all-out competition and narrow self-preservation at the expense of others, whether on the personal, 
corporate, class, ideological or national level will not be the source of any resolution or long-term human prosperity. It is going to take a new type of thinking to overcome these sociological trends and at the heart of such dramatic cultural change rests the change of the socioeconomic premise itself. Thank you.